always for providing this public access. To make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, that is how I know that you want to comment and can recognize you. To raise your virtual hand, you click on the participants in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. When you do that, a column will open up with the participants of the meeting. The raised hand feature is at the bottom of that column. If you are calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me. I'll do my best to monitor that for people having technical difficulties, but that is, that is the only purpose for which we will use that function and it will only be used during public comment. I will unmute each raised hand in order. You may comment with or without video. When you begin, please state your name and you must state your city or town for the public record. We do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. So while your comments should be directed to us, you'll understand when we don't respond to you. To ensure everyone has equal opportunity, each person has up to three minutes of time. I will begin the timer when you start speaking. If the timer goes off, I will ask you to please finish the sentence you're speaking, not the paragraph, not the page, just the very sentence that you're speaking. You can always email, your, email us your comments at citycouncilatnorthamptonma.gov. Um, and if you wanna say something that's already been said, please indicate that briefly. You don't have to use your full time. So with that being said, we will begin public comment. And the first hand, I see you, Leticia. Um, the first hand that I see is Lori Loisel. So Lori, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, my name is Laurie Loisel. I live on Grant Avenue in Northampton, Ward 3. Dear city councilors, dismantling white supremacy is the hardest thing we'll ever do as a country, but we can't stop until we do. White supremacy, the faults sometimes blatant and hateful, sometimes unconscious, subtle, and insidious belief that white people are the standard, the norm, the most valued in society, has shaped all of our systems from housing and healthcare to social work and policing. The framers of the constitution had the right idea about equality, but their actions and their words contradicted each other. And that gaslighting is the reckoning we face today. That's why I think this move to abolish or defund the police misses the mark in the narrowness of its focus and the self-righteousness of some proponents. Say we close the Northampton Police Department tomorrow, big deal. Northampton would still be overwhelmingly white, a white community, highly segregated based on race and class. It's schools and businesses, houses. Uh, Laurie, we lost you. We lost your audio. Hmm. That's weird. She's muted. Oh wait, oh hold on. Hold on. Unmute. Sorry. Okay. Now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Uh businesses, uh, I think is where you were. Okay, thank you. Uh it's schools and businesses, houses of worship and healthcare centers, financial institutions, subsidized housing and it's one institution of higher learning would still be shaped by a society that overvalues whiteness and devalues people of color. Still, people of color would have less, less asset access to power and the rooms where it happens than white people. We must neutralize this power imbalance, which is a dynamic that becomes deadly when combined with police who may carry conscious or unconscious bias. But every one of us is caught up in it because we live in a white supremacist culture. It's in the air we breathe. This is hard, hard work, and to focus on the police and police culture only is myopic. It is also white people, it also white people lets us off the hook too easily. It's like cutting off your arm when the infection has already spread to your whole body. I wholeheartedly endorse the plan to rethink how policing happens in this community, as does my Ward 3 city councilor, Jim Nash, by the way. 
His vote against the 11th hour cut of the police budget by 10% was not because he supports the status quo. He too supports looking at and drastically changing the way police go about their work and what their responsibilities are to figure out who is best suited to handle some of the duties we as a community have dumped in their lap. We are on the brink of change in our country and our city, but we can't stop with policing culture and systems. On the streets in front of the White House and today in New York City, forward-thinking leaders painted huge Black Lives Matter murals for all to see. It's more than symbolic. I think we should do it. I think we should do this on Northampton's Main Street. City Council, Mayor Narkowitz, can you make this happen? It will serve as a daily reminder to all of us to do something big or small, to chip away at the wall of supremacy that made it entirely necessary for the creation of a slogan that should have been, but never was, obvious to all, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Next, we have Jose A. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Good health to you. Um, I sent everyone an email earlier. I was born into a drug cartel. You imprisoned all my family members. They were pieces of. Sh they were. They were bad people. So. I'm, I'm glad that they learned kind of a lesson. Some of them didn't learn anything and they're still being violent and being protected by the US justice system, which does more harm than it does good. The US justice system protected, protects drug dealers in my family and prevents me from bringing true justice to my family and true protection to my family. They protect the domestic abusers in my family that sell narcotics for great profit. My family, has been bribing the police since before I was born. They've been smuggling for hundreds of years, okay? With the cooperation of the US government and the police that you've installed on the island, okay? They had to start smuggling because they didn't have any water because you were controlling all the water systems. I'm from a rainforest. It produces the most water in the world, even though it's the smallest rainforest in the world. People there had to go to lengths to acquire weapons, planes, guns, fighting skills, and goods to sell so they could buy food and water because you are invaders. You are colonizers. The police are the international death squad of the United States that protect water for white people and they take it from indigenous people, my people. You took water from my people and you jailed my parents, okay? I was only spared because I'm was a child. You should be ashamed of yourself. Anyone with police associations should resign from this process. Not to say that you don't have a place in the conversation, but moving forward, anyone with close ties to the police, the United States government should remove themselves from this conversation so that people that are well-educated in the local schools and people that are affected like me can have a calm, peaceful, reasonable conversation where we don't, where we are informed. We know what's going on. Uh, it's risky for me to even share these stories with you because my family might put a bullet in my head, okay? If I rat them out, because that's how it works. Snitches get stitches, right? You all know about that. That is common knowledge. I haven't spoken about this for my entire life because I have been living in fear of the government and of the drug dealers because they'll kill me um, and I'm a father. So I would like to very much be alive. Uh, every moment that you delay this process, innocent lives are being uh, lost. I will record this in history. I'm a teacher. I, I've, tra I've been all over the world. I've been to Europe, Australia, Africa. Um, I will go to South America and Canada. I will teach everywhere, music, history, I will teach love and I will teach healing. You will all be remembered in the light that you behave in. Behave Thank well so I can teach well about you. you, okay? Thank you. Next is, um, uh, let me, hold on one sec. Letitia? 
Letitia, would you like to comment? Yeah, yes, I would. Okay, Letitia, I have three minutes for you, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll make it really fast though. Um, my, I have an idea about may, maybe they could uh, do some like, uh, some training for the police work that's what's been going on like back, back in the day from, from Black Lives Matter. Maybe they could do like a, a training or maybe they could like help help support, like maybe we'd get them to maybe help us all, all together. Cause I know, please, cause nobody's perfect. They, maybe they, nobody's perfect. Uh, and I think people should have a right to uh, put, support their, like we can all support them, like, like, like not that someone maybe like help, help to, 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 to support them. Thank you, Letitia. Is there anything else you want to say? I I miss you, my friend, but I would like to spend some time with you next, next Letitia. week. All right, I miss you, though. Thank you. Letitia, could you do one more thing for me? Could you tell yes. could you me, could you say your full name and the town that you live in, please? Letitia, Letitia what I, I live in Northampton, and I'm se section four. Thank you. It's good to see you, Letitia. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Next, we have, um, hold on, let me oh my God, Rachel. All right, I'm hearing some background noise. I'm just going to mute some folks. Um, okay, next we have Karen Sullivan. Karen. Karen Sullivan. Hi, yes, I'm on Hi. now. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, yes, my name is Karen Sullivan from Ward 1. Um, I wish to speak to the fact that this Citizens Review Board being proposed should not include any mandates around defunding or specific policies until a thorough review is conducted. The lack of due diligence and basic research on the part of this city council in regards to this matter has been quite frankly appalling. At the previous meeting, someone falsely stated that the department hadn't updated their use of force data since 2016. I went on their website myself and found the 2019 data as well as the call log in minutes. Here are the actual stats from last year. The ones no one here bothered to look up and what I discovered in less than an hour. There were 40,040 calls last year made to the Northampton Police Department. Of those, 84 resulted in some kind of use of force. That is 0.002% of calls. Let me say that again, 0.002% of calls resulted in a use of force by our department. Of those 84 cases where use of force was used, 59 were white, 15 were black, eight were Hispanic, one was Asian, and one was Middle Eastern. Even when you combine all four of those minority groups, that means that only 0.29% of those uses of force cases involved someone who was non-white. Of all the 40,040 calls last year, 0.0006% resulted in use of force against a non-white person or any other of any background. This data does not show a pattern of police brutality or discriminatory practices in Northampton. It's time the city council started behaving responsibly rather than bending to mob mentality. There are serious issues in this country and black lives do matter, but in the Northampton Police Department is not reflective of the issues we see on a nationwide level. And to Ms. Mayori, your comments about this city not knowing whether or not police in fact lower crime is as ignorant a statement as Donald Trump saying that there are less corona cases because there's been less testing. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jonathan. Good evening, folks. My name is Jonathan Wright. Can you hear me all right? Yes, good evening. Great. Good evening. Thanks so much for 
making this uh, available to a baby zoomer. Um, uh, my, I live at 91 Olander Drive in Northampton. I wanted to comment briefly about the controversy surrounding the uh, roundabout at North King Street. I want you to uh, take your attention to the sign when we enter Northampton, it says Northampton settled 1654, which we all know is nonsense. It's the way this has been done, but it's nonsense. So everything about this route has been done meticulously by professionals according to all of the prescribed methodologies. The problem is the ground has shifted under us. You're not in the council chambers, but if you were in the council chambers and you took a timeline from the back of the hall to the front wall, 1654 occupies less than a slice of Wonder Bread. And the uh, duration of automobiles is less than the thickness of a sacramental wafer. And we are here now proposing to disrupt that entire history over a case for traffic safety. And uh, I think that it's really time uh, in the current moment to pause and think about the entire history of what has made this place what it is and find a place in our community that does not only celebrate uh, colonial times and uh, uh, notice slavery in our time and uh, take anecdotal evidence of uh, traders from uh, Nordic traders and Basque fishermen, but reach back to a time when ice was still in New England and people lived here. So this is not a matter of art, art, uh, artifacts being gathered and we got them all, as I've heard. This is about having a, a profoundly different sense of place. So I'd really encourage you to take action to pause on this well-organized, properly planned project. But it is, as I said, began, it is on now very different ground as we understand what it meant to have lived here for perhaps 10,000 years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Mark Devlin. Are you able to hear me? You know yes. I mean? yes. Okay. I've had a little bit of shaky internet, so I'm hoping I can get through less than three minutes. Uh, good evening, my name is Mark Devlin. I'm the vice president on the board of directors for River Valley Co-op. I'm speaking on behalf of River Valley Co-op of 330 Street. Council members, over 54,000 people have signed a petition calling on the city of Northampton and the state of Massachusetts to conduct further study of a rare archeological site before allowing construction of the roundabout at the intersection of Hatfield Street and Route 5 and 10. The petition shows this is an issue our community cares about. The state site report calls for further assessment and avoiding construction. And now we see that the tribal monitor is objecting to construction without further study and assessment. We know the city did not set out to destroy a rare archeological site with the roundabout plans, but in the process of planning the project, a rare ancient site eligible for the National Register of Historic Places was discovered. Now what do we do? What is the process for Northampton City Council to formally consider how we as a community will respond to such a discovery in the path of construction plans? The response so far appears to be inaction by simply deferring to the state. Given that the, plan, the state plans have only delayed the construction to, st to start August 6th, this is an urgent matter for action for our City Council. We're calling on the city council to take responsibility for the consideration of the preservation of this significant historic site within Northampton. We're asking you to join with our legislators who responded to our community interests to advocate on our behalf for time and good process to consider the best course of action. This is a complex issue that caught us all by surprise. What are the steps in consideration of the historic preservation of ancient Native American sites in the path of construction projects in Northampton? Is our community historic preservation process adequate? We are looking to our city council for leadership in addressing this eight to 10,000 year old archeological discovery in our community. This decision, the, the decision to make a roundabout was not intended to destroy an ancient archeological site, but now we know it will. And we ask now that we know better that we not lose this opportunity to do better. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. 
next is Natalia Munoz. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Natalia Munoz. I am your neighbor in Holyoke and I'm former chair of the Northampton Human Rights Commission. I lived in Northampton for decades. I covered the city for two different newspapers. I know it has flaws. I am a gay Puerto Rican woman who experiences racism and homophobia and misogyny on a daily basis. But I have to say the recent protests against the Northampton police have left me dismayed. As a member of the Human Rights Commission, I was impressed when one of Chief, Chief Casper's first stops was with the commission after she was appointed five years ago, becoming the first woman and lesbian to occupy the post. She also knows about oppression. And she asked us, what can the police do better? We desperately need reform in policing. And Chief Casper has been actively working on that. But you treat her and the police she leads as if they were a bunch of abusers and killers. Some of them may not be outstanding examples of great police officers, but there's a difference between that and being a murderer or being an abusive police officer. In fact, she leads a department of working men and women who show up when a woman is being beaten or a trans person threatened, a synagogue defaced, a person on the brink of dying from a drug overdose, an adult frightened by strange sounds in their home, or a bear or a rabid raccoon roaming their street. They are people doing very difficult jobs among the most challenging in this country. Some of the things they do must be done, but most of us wouldn't want to do them. Maybe some of these duties should be given to someone else. That is a discussion worth having. Last month, the city council cut 10% of the police budgets, police department's budget, caving into pressure from a very vocal group to which defund the police means cut the budget if you want to show you are woke. Well, okay. Yes, yeah, syst systemic racism and police culture must be dismantled and it's worth rethinking policing, but do not cut the budgets arbitrarily without a plan. Policing needs to be reimagined in our country because of the innumerable killings of unarmed black men and women by police, but it should be done thoughtfully or we won't succeed in meeting basic needs while also making necessary change. The city council did not research what the cut would mean in terms of personnel and equipment, so to people passionate about police reform, instead of calling Northampton's elected and appointed official, officials racist and going to their homes to try to intimidate them, I encourage you to focus on reforming the police in places like Minneapolis and Staten Island and Waller County, Texas, and many others where murderous police officers remain free. Out of the killing of black people in this city, the Black Lives Matter movement was born and gathered strength. And we know their names, George Floyd, Eric Garner, and Sandra Bland. But let's be real, Northampton is not one of those cities. Of course, city councilors should raise questions. That is part of your fiduciary responsibilities. That is time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Greg Skibiski. Great, thank you very much. My name is Greg Skibiski. I'm the son of John Skibiski, who I believe some of you know. I'm a resident of Florence. First of all, I would like to thank the city council for your tireless efforts to make these sometimes eight, nine hour long meetings possible. It is a lot to ask of anyone. My comments are regarding the recent discovery of an ancient eight to 10,000 year old Native American settlement at North King and Hatfield Streets in our city. My father was the former owner of this land prior to taking by eminent domain. He is a lifelong preservationist and former trustee of historic Northampton. According to the state's 164 page archeological report on the site, which documents two years of work there, this site is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Certainly discoveries like this do not happen every day in our city. The site is currently scheduled for full destruction as part of a new traffic intersection. Some weeks ago, I started an online petition which calls for the city, state, and federal governments to take steps to ensure appropriate preservation. This petition has over 54,000 signatures. I considered sharing the Zoom invitation to this meeting with all 54,000 folks and a call for participation. Then I learned that the meeting is already extremely long. 
I've requested that this petition and the state's full archaeological site report be added to the city council record. The state's report recommends preservation of the site and says that it is a, quote, incredibly rare archaeological discovery, unquote. It is disappointing that the public has been fighting to save the site without any involvement of the city. Some officials have emailed folks saying that they can't comment on the issue due to pending litigation. While it is a fact that my father sued the Massachusetts Department of Transportation over this matter, that lawsuit is only between him and MassDOT. It does not involve the city in any way. Our attorney advised that the city is not restricted from speaking. It would seem to make sense that the city start a process to share information with the public and solicit feedback. Regardless of anything, this National Register historic site is in Northampton. I believe that promoting the site could even draw tourists to our city, which would boost the economy. It would also add a new and very notable dimension to the fine public reputation of our city, which we all enjoy. Thank you again, councillors, for all you do for our city and for your patience and endurance throughout these long meetings, which allow the public to voice concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dan Kennedy. Thank you. So my name is Dan Kennedy. I am a resident of uh, Ward 4 in Northampton. Uh, I wanted to take time to thank you all for being here um, and continuing to listen to us as we call for further cuts to the police and actual reform or review. Uh, I don't actually want to say reform. I don't think that you can reform an institution um, that is so deeply rooted and based in racism um, that you'll suddenly be able to fix it. If reforms were possible, then they would have been done five years ago, 10 years ago, 70 years ago. Um, as the civil rights movement in the US was sparked, or even back into the 1900s, the early 1900s, 1906, I believe, was when the first police abolition movement began, when the police used violence to um, attack the striking labor workers. So um, I don't think you can reform this, uh, but I do wanna say that cutting the budget is the first step. Removing 10%, which is virtually nothing, wouldn't even cover the potential damages that the city will pay out because of police misconduct um, in Eric Matlock's case, right? That's still $100,000 more than that budget cut. Um, and that doesn't include the previous $140,000, I believe, that the city's paid out in police misconduct or the potential other lawsuits um, that the city is facing. To say that Northampton doesn't have a police problem is absurd. Um, in addition, while it's, not, while it's true that no one's been murdered in the streets yet, uh, that doesn't mean that it can't happen here or that it won't happen here. We've just been lucky enough that it hasn't happened yet. I think it's really important to think about that fact. Every 28 hours, a black man is killed in the US by a police officer or security guard, and it happens all over the country, each time in a different city. To say that we don't, we don't have a problem or something we need to focus on is, is absurd. We also need to look at what the state is doing. Um, the state has um, S, uh, the bill S2800, um, which is looking at different reforms that, this, at, that can happen at the state level. We also need to look at that and ways that we can take money from the police and put it into community investment. But those things need to happen simultaneously. So we're looking at you to put pressure on the executive branch to also reinvest in our communities simultaneously as you make these cuts. They cannot happen separately. If you cut money but do not, but treat it as cost-saving measures, it will only cause problems. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Jesse Hessinger. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I want to first uh, uh, say that everything that Dan just said, um, I totally agree with, and I would like to underline um, the uh, numbers that were that were uh, very quickly spouted by Karen Sullivan previously were completely skewed against the real ratio of white to BIPOC that lives in Northampton. She said some numbers that made you think that there was barely any issues at all, but when you look at the numbers themselves, out of the 84 use of force that happened in 2019, 
13 of them were against black people. That is 15 and a half percent, 15 and a half percent. There is only 3% of black people that live in Northampton. That is a five times attack on black people over any other race in Northampton by police officers. This is not a personal attack on the Northampton Police Department. This is about how the institution of police in the nation works by upholding white supremacy. As Dan also said, just because we haven't had anyone die on video in Northampton doesn't mean that it won't happen tomorrow or next week or next year. Reform is merely a Band-Aid placed over a gushing aortal wound that is systemic racism based around police upholding white supremacy. The only way that true change can occur is through abolition and creation of social emergency services. That is why we do need to create social emergency services at the same time that we are defunding the police and create these avenues so that we can make sure that there are no gaps in services and do it in a way that is actually helping the citizens of Northampton rather than harming them. And one other thing that I wanna put up while I still have the time is that there were some petitions that went out uh, to the general public that got over 200 signatures. Um, and I just wanted to follow up since two of them, one was sent to the mayor and one was sent to Chief Casper and neither of them commented on them. The, uh, these petitions demanded that funds that were taken from the police budget be moved towards a new kind of emergency assistance, one that is unarmed, trained to provide care to those in need and democratically accountable to the community and that in order to curb white supremacy and police terror, cuts to personnel prioritize, needs to prioritize officers with even alleged records of brutality, harassment, and racial bias, rather than cutting the newest hires first. This, these petitions were submitted before the budget was for 2020 was over, and there was time for the mayor to have done something about this, yet he did not. I would very much like to hear why. Thank you. Next is John Skabiski. Oh. Hi. Uh, I would like to say that uh, my request tonight is for the city council and the mayor. I would like to see them give public notice where the city stands in protecting through a preservation program an eight to 10,000 year old documented prehistoric Native American site on Hatfield Street. If the city avoids a position and continues in this fashion to remain silent in an effort to preserve local Native American history, such will be its lasting legacy. And this rare opportunity is lost. Over 54,000 petitioners are waiting for the city to announce their stand on preserving Native American history. So far, nothing has been said, not even a committee meeting to discuss the fact that something should be saved or preserved. So I ask, where will the city stand on this issue? And I think it should be made public. The public has said they are interested. So I appeal to you to concern yourself with the issue. This is a Northampton issue. And the, the site with the road going through the middle of this uh, uh, site was designed by the city. Somehow they push this over to the state, but the city was part of the designing of this thing. So they have some say in modifying it so that the site could be saved and they could improve the intersection. Everything would be solved. Merely a traffic light would take care of it. Thank you for, your, uh, for the opportunity of speaking to you. Thank you. 
Next is Naomi Francis. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Naomi Amy Francis. I live in Northampton, Ward 4. I want to thank um, all the City Council members for their continued patience and listening and reflecting on our call to abolish the police, an eventuality that we're wanting to work towards to keep our community safer and healthier. Um, I want to support and underline all that Daniel Kennedy and Jesse Hassinger said. I also want to directly address Karen Sullivan's uh, testimony. Your testimony is coming from public record that is from the police force themselves. It is clear from numerous accounts, both current and past, that the police do not report all of the facts of actions that take place when they write their reports. If you've ever tried to, write, to file a report against the police, you will know that it is a bureaucratic nightmare. And furthermore, beyond being incredibly prohibitive paperwork to fill out, it puts a target on you from the very people who are supposed to serve and protect you. When you grow up being someone who has their families and first interaction and continued interaction with the police being one of pure danger, how are you supposed to turn to that force to be the ones to help you when you're in need? This paperwork also goes directly to the police chief, which is a horrible snake eating cycle. Um, in addition, police immunity should be entirely abolished. There is no reason for the police to harm anyone. So having any harm from the police to our citizens, for me, is absolutely unacceptable. There are other ways to serve our community, keep our community safe, and have them healthy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next is Mac G. My name is Mac Godinez of Ward 2 in Northampton. I'm calling to seek public response from the mayor regarding the petitions that Jesse Hassinger mentioned. Um, I'm also calling to seek clarity on the appointment process of the proposed commission. I want the mayor and the council to be very clear, not only tonight or any other nights over Zoom, but also publicly over the course of the next several weeks on social media, through physical flyers, and by other, any other creative means that can be determined in both English and Spanish with respect to the appointment and application processes. And I really want the council and the mayor to ensure that there is no police presence on any commission that is formed and no members with any affiliation on any level with the police. Otherwise, it will have no real power. Thank you. Next is Elliot. Hi, uh, my name is Elliot Oberholzer. I live in East Hampton, but I work in Northampton. Um, I am here today to read a statement from the Nitmug Nation of Massachusetts. I'm not Nitmug, um, but their voices aren't being brought in here, so I'm trying to do that. Um, this statement starts, regarding the archeological site at Hadfield Street and Route 5 and 10 Northampton, Massachusetts, to whom it may concern, this statement is on behalf of the people of the Nipmuc Nation. Nipmuc Nation is one of the tribal communities with kinship ties to the indigenous ancestors of what is now Northampton, Massachusetts. We are aware that excavation of the site in question was conducted over the past two years. We are not at liberty to discuss the artifacts that have been removed from this site, but we want to clarify certain issues. The current issue in the media to stop construction of a roundabout is a matter between a private landowner and the state. It does not involve our tribal community. Greg Sabisti's claim in his petition titled Do Not Destroy the 10,000-Year-Old Ancient Village in Northampton to Save the Site that he was joining with the Native American community is false and misleading. His position of petition does not represent any local Native American tribes in the region, nor any tribal individuals we are aware of, nor did he consult with the two close tribal communities of Nipmuc and Abenaki. Anyone claiming to represent or speak on behalf of the tribal people of the area is not affiliated in any way with the Nipmuc Nation. I'm gonna skip a bit for time. Uh, the Sabisky family filed suit in the US District Court in June of this year, seeking monetary damages for the loss of all artifacts removed from the site. The suit claims that the artifacts have monetary value and should be returned to their rightful owner, John Sabisky. 
no tribal group has nor will support this claim. The rightful owners of any and all artifacts are the ancestors themselves and all artifacts removed from the site should be returned to the earth. The recent petition by Greg Sabisky has contributed to confusion among the public and has spread misinformation as he is unfamiliar with section 106, archeological and preservation practices and is not working with tribal people of the area. For example, site preservation only occurs if no additional archeology span were to be conducted. The archeological process is itself a destructive process. Zabitsky's petition calls for action to preserve the undisturbed ancient village site. There's no evidence that this is a village site and through archeology span disturbance has already occurred. We are grateful for all the allies who have called, messaged emails and offered to support an action. Thank you all. Um, given the current information and facts still to be discovered, the Nimuk Nation is not calling for any action at this time regarding preservation of this site. However, if construction at this site occurs, tribal representatives will participate in monitoring, and if support of the public and our allies is needed for any reason, we will make a request at that time. So I'd like to be completely clear here. Uh, Native peoples are still here. They are still speaking. Their nations still have sovereignty. It is not acceptable to erase their voices in, in the interests of co-opting their legacy. Um, if the city council is going to take a position, I'd like that position to be clearly that you will be working with the Nimbuk Nation and will follow their wishes in this matter. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next is Summer Cable. Hi, um, my name is Summer Cable and I live in Northampton Ward 1. I would also like to express my concern over the recent publicity surrounding the archaeological site on North King Street. I believe that the intentions of those who have signed the Skibiskis petition are good, but ultimately the attention being brought by the author of the petition and the publicity that was, it was given by River Valley Market have put the site in harm's way. Archaeological surveys conducted by the State Historic Preservation Office are typically kept private in order to protect the site. By circulating the SHPO report, the areas of the site that are not expected to be impacted by construction of the roundabout are now vulnerable to looters by so-called looting by so-called amateur archaeologists. I know this is not the City Council's purview, but I really believe it's important for the general public to be made aware of the very real risk archaeological sites face when they're dragged into the spotlight in this way. While most people recognize the importance of keeping this site safe, there are those who put a monetary value on artifacts and who engage in looting archaeological sites for the purpose of selling artifacts. Those people are a danger to cultural and scientific value of archaeological sites, such as the one on North Ham or, um, King Street. I would ask those with a genuine interest in preserving this site to stop circulating the State Historic Preservation Report and stop publicly assigning a monetary value to artifacts that might still be in the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rowan. Hello, um, I'm on, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hi, um, Rowan Lupton, she, they, Ward 6. Um, apparently it needs to be explicitly said, the movement toward police abolition is just one aspect of the struggle against, struggle against systemic racism. From prisons to education to our current political apparatus born out of compromise with the white supremacist confederacy, I assume all of, I assure all of you, we are looking at the work of anti-racism through a broad lens. The police are an early and highly visible target of anti-racist work because they're allowed to use force and intimidation against us, the people. Even if it were true that the NPD rarely used force, easy for a white person to say, not to mention any force against a civilian should be considered excessive, especially by, by an arm, armed government organization. Overt force is just one of the ways that the police terrorize their communities. If you're not aware of all the ways that police use their position to intimidate, you haven't been listening to the people's testimony in these meetings. You can go look those up on YouTube. A mural is worthless without deep structural change. A lesbian cop is still a cop and a traitor to the queer movement, no cops at pride. A city that pretends to care about racism that continues to fund an armed occupying force, which is racist by its very structure, is still fundamentally structurally racist. While we're here, many of us calling in along with our counselors have unanswered questions of Narkowitz and Casper. From the use of force on teenagers to Casper's decision to continue to employ pigs who we know have harmed our community, we eagerly await the time and place to ask these questions. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is 
Alex D. Good evening. My name is Alex Deschamps. I am a former resident of Northampton and currently live in Sunderland. I agree with everything said by Dan, Jesse, no Naomi, Mac, and Rowan. I want to thank the council for listening to the citizens of the city and visitors who have ex shared their experiences with the Northampton Police Department. It is deeply disappointing that individuals who insist that they've never experienced problems with the department are choosing to ignore the experiences of others. You have heard from academics, activists, and your own constituents who have absolutely done their due diligence, Karen. Defunding the police is the right choice. Working to make all individuals in Northampton feel and be safe is the right choice. Placing focus on upholding the rights and safety of humans through social programs is the right choice. You have done well by the initial 10% cut. Please continue to work with your constituents to defund the police and make them feel safe. With regards to the roundabout, I will also add that listening to the native peoples who have already clearly indicated their desires around the space is absolutely necessary. And I thank Elliot and Summer for speaking up around this topic. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is DSA line 13. Hi, sorry, I'm on a group account. Um, my name is Annie Wood. I'm a Ward 3 resident um, and a member of Pioneer Valley DSA and UAW Local 2322. Um, it's clear to me that this commission is a bureaucratic measure to divert the ongoing movement against the police into committees and meetings rather than real change. Um, council has thus far ignored the demand for police abolition put forward by the people of color, LGBTQ people, and workers whose rent and labor the city relies on. Northampton has an urgent and violent policing problem. I personally witnessed police brutality here twice, once by officers Nicholas Lamouge and Kevin Cook during a wellness call, and once in June when several children were pepper sprayed during a protest by the police. Um, we demand that you defund, disarm, and disband the Northampton Police Department now. Actions, not commissions. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Richard Aslan. Hello, my name is Richard Aslan. I'm a resident of Northampton, and I'd like to pause at this point and make sure that these two issues that have been discussed extensively, if other people are in line to discuss those issues, because I'm about to discuss something completely different. So maybe I should just pause here and ask if there's anyone else who wishes to comment on those other two issues. Um, so Richard, we don't respond during public comment, but also that's not how public comment works. You you may speak on any topic, so go right ahead. Okay, I just wanted to not be out of order. I appreciate it. I'd like to thank the City Council for providing the opportunity to address a number of important community issues. My comments center on a small neighborhood in Village Hill, the old Hospital Hill site. At this time, Kent Pecoy and Sons Construction, the developer chosen by Mass Development for the Northview subdivision in Village Hill, has begun the process of liquidation of all of his business operations. They have, Picoy has abandoned the Northview site and all work has stopped, leaving the residents in legal limbo with a partially completed infrastructure that is causing flooding and property damage. We respectfully ask the city of Northampton to step up and complete the project with the active participation of the Northview homeowners. At present, the residents will not be members of a homeowners association until the last lot is conveyed. Until that time, Kent Pecoy controls the homeowners association. The existing homeowners currently have no rights to the common property. Furthermore, we are obligated by covenants to nothing more than maintenance of completed infrastructure, including the road, the rainwater system, and associated detention ponds. None of these have been completed. For the past two years plus, the Higgins Way Road has become flooded and impassable due to the non-operable rainwater system. This happens routinely with every passing rainstorm, possibly including this evening. Recent storms have exposed a much greater threat to property damage is now occurring both to existing homes and still unsold lots. In addition, there are uncontrolled storm water releases flowing down to the Mill River. Our residents have physically toiled to build crushed stone diversions and dams to mitigate the uncontrolled rain and mud flows with very limited success and without assistance from Pequot. 
we are, the residents have brought these issues before appropriate city personnel on multiple occasions, but nothing has so far been done. Among the issues we have raised are infrastructure being built outside of the plan specifications, occupancy permits issued for dwellings that do not comply with the stormwater plan, and non-compliance by the developer that has not been addressed or enforced by the city. In addition, the city has continued to release PCOI from its performance guarantee, thereby reducing the available funds held to ensure the project's completion, all despite the common knowledge that PCOI is in financial difficulty. So the residents were never part of the decisions about planning, funding, or developer selection, and we have no responsibility for anything but maintenance of a completed project, which includes this, the fun fully functioning engineer certified stormwater system. Yet city officials have suggested that if the city has not retained sufficient funds to complete the project, the residents of Northview should pay for it. That's time. Do you want to finish Thank your you. sentence? Okay. Thank you for, uh, for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Next is Oriana R. Hi, my name is Oriana Riley. I live in Ward 3, and I um, am speaking about the resolution to, uh, about for the Police Review Commission, and I want to echo the words of Dan, Jesse, Amy, Rowan, Alex, and Annie. Um, I feel like this, the council has continued to show that you are missing the point of everything that the hundreds of people who've shown up to your meetings to say disarm, defund, and disband the police have said. Um, I, we clearly told you with at least 120 people on the call at the last meeting that we do not support the commission and you continued to go ahead with it and give yourselves a pat on the back for supposedly doing something good for police reform. Um, again, we don't want police reform. We want the police to be abolished and we want the money to be spent on things that will actually help our community um, and reduce crime because again, the police do not reduce crime. Um, further, since you're insisting on going ahead with this commission that none of us want or ask for, or that the purpose is useful, I do just wanna bring up that nothing in the commission's description or how it's gonna be appointed bans cops or police from being on it, which is a huge problem. So I'm gonna read some um, criteria that I think should be added if you're gonna have this commission. This comes from um, people in Chicago working on an elected accountability council. So an individual shall not be eligible to join this commission if they have ever served as a law enforcement officer, had a family member, including the spouse, domestic partner, partner to a civil union, or any of the following, whether by blood, marriage, or adoption, parent, son, daughter, stepson, stepdaughter, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, grandparent, et cetera, I'm gonna skip that, um, who has ever served as a law enforcement officer, <laughs> or who has ever been employed by the, um, the district attorney, or who has ever been convicted of bribery, embezzlement, extortion, perjury, or other commission related offenses, or fails to disclose any personal, professional, or financial conflict of interest. Um, those are the main, the main things. You, <laughs> it sounds like you're gonna appoint cops and people related to cops to this commission, who then are of course gonna say, there's no problem in Northampton, we don't need to do anything about it, um, and you all can continue to pat yourselves on the back and think you're doing something good for the community. When we aren't. Fuck the police. Bye. Next is Sasha. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Sasha. I live in East Hampton. Um, <laughs> you can never make a plan to create alternatives to the police unless you first defund the police. You can discuss and deliberate changes to policing till the end of time, 
but until you take their funding, the situation's not gonna change. Look at what's already happened so far. You took $880,000 from the police budget that was proposed this year. Where's that money going to go? Why hasn't the mayor come forward to help allocate that money as intended toward alternatives to policing? You haven't taken enough money away yet change police. It's still business as usual. Until you take their funding and start funding alternatives to police, there's no realistic path to alternatives to police. You don't need a plan to reduce the police budget. When you reduce the police budget, only then can you actually make a plan because only then do you have the power to make change happen. The police budget in 2013 was like $4.8 million. Last year, it was 6.7 million. Why do you think that happened? Why was the plan to keep giving the police more and more millions of dollars? Reform is never gonna be a solution to the issues inherent in policing. You can't fix a system that isn't broken. Police were never designed to protect black people or poor people or undocumented people. Police are doing exactly what they were meant to do and that's not gonna change. What needs to change is the way that we utilize police in our community. Yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, Jillian Love is next. Hi, Jillian Love, Ward 4. I am honestly incredibly disappointed with the city council and their decision to try and move forward with this committee that honestly, or this commission that as many people have stated is focused a lot more on reform that many of us know already doesn't work. There's a lot of information out there that supports that police reform is ineffective and it does nothing to protect the lives of BIPOC. I also wanna say that I am a person of color and I've noted from attending various meetings that it feels as if our voices honestly don't matter. Um, continuously, I've heard even some, some of the council members listen to two hours of statements from the public who have expressed that they do not trust the police, they want to defund the police, they do not support this commission, we don't like the, um, the goals of it or the real, the lack of any sort of accountability that would come from it. And yet then there are city council members who will speak about other people who aren't choosing to be present, who haven't been putting in the work, um, kind of elevating their voices more. And those are the people who do support the police, who do, and like that shows where you stand and who you truly want to listen to. You have to do better. People are showing up for a reason and we matter. As it was stated by others as well, that this commission, it just, it's, it's truly pointless. It doesn't, it does nothing to address any of the real issues that are coming from systemic oppression enacted through the system of police. We don't need it. It's not, it's not healthy to BIPOC. It hasn't been healthy to me personally. I myself have actually been assaulted. I may have mentioned this before. It was not by a Northampton police officer, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen here. And that doesn't mean that even without brute force being um, enacted against the people of this city that people aren't still being harmed. I really, we, we wanted a select committee because we felt as if our voices and our efforts would be emphasized more as if it would be shown that what we said and what we cared for actually mattered to not only the city council, but to this entire town because police reform, this commission, a study on, on information that we've already been able to gather for you without being paid, without having um, extra support behind us, just us as community members. We have a lot of information out here. There's so many resources that we've been able to tap into that you haven't even attempted to, and we have no faith that this commission will do that. 
there's no reason to be pushing this forward other than to, yeah, to try and pat yourselves on the back and act as if you're doing something good when you're really not. It's inaction. We need real action. Thank you. Defund the police. Thank you. Okay. That I, okay. Ezekiel Beth. Hi, um, I just wanted to speak briefly about reallocation. Um, as has been mentioned before, the mayor hasn't set any orders yet or recommended any orders to be taken up around reallocating um, from the stabilization fund towards any of the sort of asks or demands around social services, restorative justice in the schools, et cetera. Yet there is an order today, 20.090, to appropriate $90,000 from stabilization um, for health and safety improvements to the treasurer collector's office. That is definitely important to make the office more safe, but I think it's worth questioning the mayor on why he is able to create this order to move money from the stabilization fund, yet he has not yet chosen to recommend any orders reallocating money towards the social services needs of the city. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, seeing no further public comment, we will close public comment and take the roll and convene, please. Councilor oh. Dwight. Hold up, wait one second. Here. Councillor Foster. Hold on, let me find him. I'm gonna ask people to turn off your video. I can't find the council if I can't see the council. So please turn off your video. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Labarge. Hold on, gotcha. Here. Councillor Mayori. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, we are convened. And the first item is the announcement of a public hearing. Um, this is 20.063 National Grid Verizon New England Poll Petition for Hebert Avenue. Uh, in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 166, Section 22, a public hearing will be held on Thursday, August 20th, 2020 at 7.05 p.m. on the petition of National Grid Verizon New England to erect poles and wires upon, along, under, or across one or more public ways. That's poll petition number 28701070. The hearing will be held via remote participation. Please see the agenda for the August 20, 2020 City Council meeting for instruction for accessing that hearing. So that is the announcement for that hearing. Um, are there any updates from committee chairs? Uh, Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, I just wanna announce that we are having a city service meeting on July 20th on a Monday at four o'clock PM and it will be virtual Zooming. Thank you. Any other, I'm trying, okay, hold on. I can't see all of the council. Um, hold on, I'm just making sure I can see everybody because I, give me a sec, everyone. I still can't see some people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I got everybody. Um, any other, any other committee chair announcements? Seeing none, any one minute announcements? Oh, sorry. So, sorry. Sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> Councilor Jarrett. Uh, hello. Um, I'm going to be holding a Ward 5 gathering on Zoom. Uh, it'll be this Sunday, July 12th from 4 to 5 p.m. 
and it will be an opportunity for questions and answers to hear concerns and ideas. You know, before COVID-19, I had planned monthly gatherings around the ward, um, so I've really missed the opportunities uh, for us to meet. So, um, and uh, I'm asking people to register in advance and then you'll receive the Zoom link. You can do that on my website, Facebook page, or by emailing or calling me. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other one minute announcements? Okay, Sina, I'm gonna tell you guys what's distracting me. Uh, Zoom has yet again changed some settings and it looks like I've lost the ability to make the council co-hosts. So that brief time we had with that setting is now gone. Um, so we're just gonna go on like this. Um, and I guess if I have to mute you, I I'm just gonna watch um, and uh, look for people. But right now I can see the council, so we're okay. Um, okay, Mr. Mayor, any communications? Oh, sorry. Hold on. Oops. All right, hold on. Um, I have no communications this evening. Okay, thank you. Hold on, I need to do one other thing because uh, things keep popping up in my view. Okay. So, um, then moving on, we have resolutions. So first up is the withdrawal of 20.076, a resolution establishing a select committee on legislative approaches to public safety. Uh, the process note is that um, the sponsors have requested to withdraw this resolution, but have asked to give a brief explanation. So I'm gonna give, the give them the courtesy of having the floor, um, but it's being withdrawn, so there'll be no discussion on this resolution. So, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. Um, so Councillor Mayori and I decided to withdraw this, um, part, so several reasons. First, given that we now, we introduced this before we knew the scope of the Northampton Policing Review Commission. And um, now that we know the scope and have, have had the opportunity to give comment and um, see the how it's changed, um, we're not ready to ask for a select committee at this time. And I, I wanna say it's at this time. Um, we will be asking one or more of our standing city council committees to explore the legislative options that we have. Um, once we have a clear, also once we have a clear idea of the makeup of the commission, we may propose a select committee to fill in the gaps or to specifically work on the legislative possibilities. Um, and uh, it just wanna reiterate that, um, that it isn't exactly clear to me what our legislative options are um, the pesticide reduction ordinance made it clear that there is some leeway to set policy that the executive branch carries out. So becoming more informed um, and with independent legal opinions will help us carry out any recommendations from the commission or other action that the council um, wants to decide upon. So um, that's, I'll turn it over to Councillor Mayori for uh, her viewpoint on it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Yeah, I mean, I will. Uh, this was a tough decision, and I really uh, hear the concerns of residents, and, and I share them. Um, since the, the formation of the Joint Commission seemingly moving forward, uh, this seemed like the best way to stagger our efforts, and um, we just uh, we still see this as something we can pursue in the future. If uh, we wanted to actually clarify a lot of the language and, and the mission in the council select committee resolution anyway. So it, the good thing is, yeah, if we decide we want to move forward, we can simply submit a resolution to form another uh, a select committee or, you know, another, another avenue as uh, Council Jarrett has outlined. I, I still think it's critical, as Council Jarrett has said, that the council explore the range of our legislative options and our role here regarding transforming our public safety system uh, in Northampton. Uh, and because of that, I will also be pursuing an independent council kind of role here, um, forging specifically a path forward for the council. And um, I, um, I look forward to talking to residents more as the commission 
starts taking shape, I think that we can um, come back and, and revisit uh, what would be a good supplement uh, to the Joint Commission. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so then moving on to 20.096, a resolution regarding the Northampton Policing Review Commission. I will read the resolution. Um, so in City Council, July 9th, 2020, upon the recommendation of City Council Jean Louis Shara and Mayor David J. Narkowitz, uh, our 20.096 resolution regarding the Northampton Policing Review Commission, whereas on June 8th, 2020, in the letter with the revised order for the FY 2021 general fund budget, Mayor Narkowitz, quote, committed to working with the city council to address the larger systemic is issues of institutional racism and bias laid bare once again by the tragic killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers on May 25th, 2020, end quote. And whereas at the June 10th special meeting of the city council to continue deliberation on the FY 2021 general fund budget, the city council asked council, Pre council president Shara and mayor Narkowitz to bring to the next meeting and before the second vote on the FY 2021 general fund, a plan for both branches to work together to bring about meaningful change to policing and public safety. And whereas on June 18th, mayor Narkowitz and council president Shara presented the Northampton policing review commission, a joint commission of both branches of government quote, to study these complex issues and recommend reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures municipal funding allocations and policies and ordinances that together can transform how the city delivers policing services while ensuring community safety equitably and justly for all, end quote. And whereas the discussion on the commission was continued to a special meeting of the city council on June 23rd, where additional feedback from the council and the public was heard and discussed and then incorporated into the commission document. Therefore, be it resolved that the city council and mayor shall create the Northampton Policing Review Commission with the process composition and timeline delineated in the commission document. Move so, approval. Motion has been made by Councillor Dwight. Second it. Seconded by Councillor Labarge. Um, I will just, I don't, I'll go first, that's okay. Um, I don't have much to add. The resolution outlines, uh, you know, the process that we've gone through and the discussion that we've had um, and the commission document has actually been updated to reflect the feedback. Um, and I, I know I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm sure the mayor would as well. Um, a couple things I'll note that have been updated. Um, instead of the usual multi-member body application, we're asking for those that are interested to send a letter of interest to either the mayor or the city council. Um, those, those letters of interest can be mailed or they can be emailed if someone cannot submit it that way. Um, then we can receive that information verbally, by phone, in person, from a safe distance. However, someone needs to relay their interest to us. Um, and along those lines, actually, of providing access to those who may need it, I've spoken to Northampton Open Media. Again, true heroes for our community for connection and access. Um, and NAM um, has said that they can provide support in terms of their networks and computer access, computer access at their facility at 33 Holly Street for at least two members of the commission in a safe and accessible way that would also be along with uh, staff support on site for them. So if that's needed by anyone, um, they're able to offer that access and I'm extremely grateful to them. Um, and other thing I'll note, since the process to today is added three weeks from when we first presented the commission on June 18th, we've adjusted the timelines a bit. Um, and uh, because of that, I also would respectfully request two readings tonight to be able to hit these new timelines and these new deadlines that we've put in there. Um, they, we're asking that the letters of interest be received by Friday, August 14th, um, and that the appointment process will now be completed on or before September 3rd, and the commission shall convene its first organizational meeting no later than September 24th. Uh, the preliminary report deadline remains at on or before December 17th, and the final report now is on or before March 18th, 2021, which gives almost two months before the mayor must submit the budget to the council. Um, we've also added language that the commission may request an extension, but again, it's extremely important to me that we have information from them before we need to make decisions on next year's 2021 budget. Um, so again, this is an ambitious timeline that we've laid out, but 
um, you know, we feel the urgency of the moment and the movement really call for it. Um, and if anyone has any questions or uh, Mayor Narkowitz, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. I know you've covered it quite completely. And again, thank you for um, all the feedback that we received and I think we've tried to incorporate it. So thank you. Councillor Mayori, hold on. Uh, yeah, so you were just sort of saying about the letter of interest. So how are we going to um, ascertain um, the seats that were meant for um, uh, Black folks and people of color and most impacted? Is there going to be any kind of uh, if the, if the letter of interest is open and we might not know that? No. That's true. I mean, yeah. we, we discussed it um, and I think we're hoping that, you know, what we really want is the narrative from people as to what their interest is and why this matters to them. And I'm hoping that they're gonna divulge that information to us, um, you know, and that, cause it's pertinent to this discussion yeah. that we're having. I suppose we could also just follow up with, I mean, the probably people give, I was just curious about that part. Um, yeah, obviously we'll have to ask for contact information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, um, and I had a resident ask me, well, a resident who stressed the importance of a chair, the chair of, of a commission like that um, and ask me questions about the, how that if there will be a chair, how that will happen. And also um, ask me um, how the counselors will be chosen to be on the commission. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have it in the document that, that the chair will be chosen by the body themselves and that they can't be counselors actually. Um, we wanted them to be residents um, and and we left it open whether they wanted to be have one chair or two chairs, co-chairs on it. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the counselors, actually, I'm um, we're still trying to determine with the attorney general's office whether what's what's allowable op under open meeting law in terms of who how the council could choose. Um, their appointees. I had a conversation with the solicitor today and we're checking with the AG's office um, because there's a possibility that any subgroup of a council who would be doing this would be considered a subcommittee and then would be subject to open meeting law themselves. Right. So we're yeah. trying to get clarification on that tomorrow. Um, thank you. Uh, can I just ask or, or put out a few other things? Um, I do, I do agree with uh, residents that a lot of what, what's on there has been researched so, so I do really hope that we'll be um, going very quickly from review doing a literature review to really getting on you know the task and the action uh, ahead of us and making things happen and tailoring them for our city and um, and I do I think there is a, a time to work with the police on this one once we have um, once once our, our plan is completed I think we'll have to work very closely with the PD if we're going to implement changes and alternatives. But I, I don't. I agree with uh, some of the speakers that I don't think that this um, commission is the place for uh, police officers themselves. I think the community really needs to set our agenda outside of that paradigm and then go with our agenda and, and work out the things as we need to do with other city departments. So I'll just put that out there. Okay. I guess that's I think that's it for me. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I can't speak to your latter point, but the earlier one, um, which now has flown out of my head, which was about, sorry, <laughs> help me out. Oh, sorry, I, I threw a lot at you at once. And I'm, um, I, I was talking about um, uh, spending less time on like literature. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for the refresher. Um, what I would say, so of course, this is going to be an open, as we're just, this, this body itself will be subject to open meeting law. These will all be public meetings. And so even if someone's not on the commission, they will have public comment. They will, as you know, we've said they have to have a minimum of three public hearings. Mm -hmm. um, but I am sure that they will gladly receive information and any research that's been done and that, and people should feel free to share that with them both verbally at the meetings, but also to forward information to them. Uh, and, and so is, is there a policy yet about the police serving on this commission? 
or people in law enforcement at all? I've unmuted the mayor because as you know, we oh. can't give directives to the system. Um, yeah, it was an inquiry, yeah. It was not my intention to appoint anyone from the police department on the commission. I mean, typically when I do reviews of a, of a city agency, I generally, it's not done by the agency itself. It's done by an external review, um, whether it's a consultant or it's a committee. So it was not my intention to appoint anyone from the police department to serve. I don't know, I can't speak for the council. I mean, it was certainly not my intention. Also, I recognize I would, I couldn't ask them to do it without asking uh, the executive branch whether um, that was okay for them to serve in that capacity, but it was not my intention. Councillor Jarrett. Um, just something that is direct, sort of directly related. Uh, um, the city council shall appoint nine members by a review process to be determined by each point of authority. You mentioned uh, a little bit about how you're trying to figure out how the councillors that will be two of those nine members, but then how will we determine that uh, process? Would that be at our August 20th meeting? Um, could you speak to that? Um, I may have, I, I may not have been clear. I, what I was speaking to was how the council would appoint the process for that the, for the council appointing the additional members, not the council members, right? Okay. So, because that's the question that um, we need clarification on, because it's possible that any subset of the council doing that work would have to do it, would, would be considered a subcommittee and would be subject to open meeting law. Right, so then um, separate from that, the review process, I mean, the how will we, so, okay, and then, the two that are chosen um, will be the ones who choose who review the that's not, applications. Not no, we don't know that either. We okay. don't. Right. That's that is the question that needs to be answered. Whether that whether that process is even possible. So, uh, which I wasn't aware of, but have learned potentially would make that process subject to open meeting law. Which again, I just you know. Oh, I believe in doing things publicly and openly, but when you're asking people to give you narrative letters of interest about why they would like to serve on this sort of commission that may have personal information in it, it doesn't feel appropriate to then divulge those and discuss them in a, in a public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but the nine or the seven remaining, we will vote on those no no okay and i'm just trying to get clarity on the the process so there's no way that we can do that process without having it be an open you know going through person by person and voting on them uh -huh. which doesn't feel comfortable to me to do that process in public about people and difficult stories they may tell or things like that. And it, it's just, it's not how these sorts of, it's not how commissions are chosen, but, and for those kinds of reasons. Well, I'm thinking, you know, our usual process is a referral to city services. I mean, in terms of how commissions are chosen, you know, if you're talking about the, um, <clears throat> say the, the um, Transportation and Parking Commission or, or something like that. And then people have individual conversations, report back, and then there is a confirmation or a vote by the city council. So there's an opportunity there perhaps for individual one-on-one -on -one discussion and then a public, um, a public part as well. But you're not, you're thinking a, we would not do a similar process. Um, if we were to do a process like that, that would, I can't even imagine how many weeks that would tack on at this point to do that process or whether we even could do that kind of process. Okay, yeah. Um, 
Councillor Nash. Yeah, I had to mute myself. My dog was barking. Oh, okay. So my apologies. Um, so will we, so essentially you'll put together the, the slate of candidates and will we vote on the slate? Rather than going through the particulars of which, which individual, but is, I, I think in, in my mind, it would appropriate, be appropriate for council to endorse the slate that is to be appointed. Um, that's my thought on that. And I think that um, kind of crosses with uh, Councillor Jarrett's uh, concerns. I mean, certainly whatever process we can do, the people that are chosen were gonna be presented as as the appointees on August 20th. Oh, sorry, Councillor. Uh, oh, I see Councillor Dwight and then Councillor Labarge. <clears throat> um, I would, uh, uh, Councillor Jared actually referred to the pesticide thing, which is actually a reasonable example. The council president made the appointments um, while um, the appointees were not subject to review by the council, um, part, partly for the same reason that we're discussing now, the timeline was way, way, way too narrow. Um, and as a result, it, they, there was already intense pressure for them to cr generate a, a voluminous, detailed study and report in a very short time. And that's the case here as well. Under our rules, council president it would ultimately be the person who is doing the appointments. Now, what Councillor Shara is offering at this point is participatory um, selection, but at the same time trying to keep in mind how we have to expedite this in order to actually start to realize it. Um, in, in the past, we have not approved, we didn't approve um, members of, of the Pesticides Committee. They were formed by, as a directive of the Council President, uh, Ryan O'Donnell at the time. When I created the, um, when I was Council President and Council O'Donnell was uh, Vice President at the time, we created a, a similar commission to study the uh, downtown environment and what it meant for the public and what it meant for the businesses and so on. Again, we didn't, the council did not have an opportunity to, it was called a council appointment, but when in fact it was the council president and vice president in that case that made the selections. I think in, 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 in both those cases and all those cases, actually all those committees um, generated amazing work and also had amazing participants. That's not to say that there will be some people that might get appointed who would be people would find objectionable for, for a variety of reasons. You heard tonight, people just object to the existence or even the premise of having this commission. So um, I, I want to be careful in getting bogged down. If there, I imagine if there is an appointee who is so egregiously um, failing or coming up short that the council would not be bashful about challenging that appointment. But beyond that, I think um, we're going to have to invest an aspect of trust here, I think. And, and if we continue, if we expand the vetting process by, pro, uh, by doing meetings, especially in this abbreviated meeting schedule that we have for the summer, this, we're never going to come close to the timelines that are already so abbreviated that, that um, we run the risk of actually rendering this thing uh, moot, and I, I, for one, would like to avoid that. Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, thank you, Councillor Dwight. Um, I'm going to echo what you said about the pesticide committee, the commission, right down the line, and the others. Um, I also want to know, Councillor President Gina Louise Shera, in regards to the mayor is appointing somebody from the Human Rights Commission, correct, Mayor? Yes. Right. How about, I haven't heard anything about like the Commission on Disabilities or people with disabilities. And I think that they should be looked at very, very carefully here of being involved in this new commission that 
we are putting in place. So I have concerns about that, that we at least look at the Commission on Disabilities to be part of this police commission. Just an idea that I'm, you know, bringing forth to you, but I, I think it's very valuable here. I would certainly welcome people with disabilities to apply for, you know, the council positions or for the mayoral positions and um, would want to know their experience and, and um, would take their experience into account, just as I would other other groups. So, uh, you know, I, I, I very much welcome Thank them you. applying. I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Mayori, then Councillor Foster. I mean, uh, there are nine councillors and uh, nine appointments. Maybe each councillor could appoint one or you have a final appointing authority over one uh, seat. Just an idea. Thank you. Uh, so I Councillor Foster and then Councillor Dwight. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm hearing from from public comment tonight as well that that um, you know there are people, as Councillor Dwight mentioned, um, who object to the the formation of the commission. And I just want to state again, I, I think that this is a process that has really um, some good potential and yet also recognize that the work, I think uh, the commission will have some work to do to help rebuild trust um, you know, with the community as well as to uh, consider this research and um, make recommendations. And then, you know, the, the question around accountability has been, you know, what is the accountability of the commission? And as a joint mayoral city council, Commission, I really see that the accountability is 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 us and, and our response to our constituents, um, and and that's that's a process I'm committed to. Um, I wanted to clarify, I guess, a couple of things. One, you know, with with the city services committee, um, when we confirm appointments, usually what we're doing is we're confirming an appointment that the mayor has brought to us and we're saying, yes, this is somebody we would support in a commission. It's, it's a slightly more complete process than fully vetting applications um, in an open meeting. It, it is true that we'll take an application, we'll look at it, we'll have an individual uh, phone call and then we'll report back to the committee. Um, but I certainly understand um, and appreciate the, the privacy concerns and I would have a very hard time um, in a public open meeting, um, you know, really, kind of discussing someone's story as Councilor Shara um, alluded to. Um, you know, one thing I've heard really um, some great interest from Ward 2, um, people who are interested in serving. Uh, and that's been really exciting. I've, I've had several people contact me who are ready to be involved. And I, and I look forward, um, you know, to, to, to outreaching to people who are interested as well as to helping shepherd uh, applications through from people who are interested. Um, and so I, I wanted to clarify one piece, the letter of, of interest. Um, you know, there are people who are comfortable with me as a counselor who might wanna send that to me. And then uh, is that something I would forward on to council or would people uh, need to send that directly to, um, you know, the city council email or council president? Um, and just thinking, you know, part of that question is, is um, I recognize that submitting a letter of interest for some folks will be a barrier and I'd be glad to have a phone call and, and help somebody through that letter. Um, so just wanted to, to verify that process or, or make sure I'm thinking along lines that make sense. Um, sure, I mean, if people wanted to give that information to you, but then it would have to get to me. Um, you know, what the mayor and I very, very briefly talked about today, but is that, you know, we will have a web page on the city website that will be devoted to the commission that will have all the information that will be, you know, directly linked to either the mayor's side or our side if people want to apply to one or the other um, and give any other information would be um, in English and in Spanish. And, um, and so I'm not sure if that's if I'm answering your question, but certainly if that's However, however, someone wants to apply, if there's some kind of barrier, we want to help them get over that barrier. So if it's that they feel comfortable telling the story to you and then you relay it to me, 
I'm fine with that. Um, but we'll have to get the information somehow. No, that, that makes sense. So that's something that I as a counselor can offer to Ward 2 to help people with the application process. And uh, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And again, yeah. if people ha have, you know, technology barriers, Northampton Open Media has, has offered help uh, for people serving on the commission, but I'm sure um, would provide help during the application process. Um, you know, however people need to relay their story to us, we will find a way to, to get it. Councillor, I see Councillor Dwight and then Councillor Labarge. So uh, actually to Council Mayor's suggestion about uh, individual councillors forwarding recommendations, that actually is the process by which we actually did the Charter Commission, for instance. There were, oh, um, we also did that with the um, uh, committee that came up with a formula to um, assess stormwater management and, and evaluation. So it's not out of the realm of, that's not unprecedented. I, I, I just want to reiterate that, of course, under our rules, council rules, it is the, the, it is the sole um, duty of the council president. I'm sorry, the council president is the sole person to make committee appointments um, uh, for, of the council, not the council in toto. It's, uh, but the fact is, I think I like, I think that's worth considering is having recommendations coming from individual counselors. That's a possibility. The, uh, uh, but at the same time, I don't want it to serve as a disqualifier for people who, for instance, um, don't know their counsel or don't feel comfortable contacting their counselor. I don't want them to be a disqualifier for someone being eligible to serve on this committee. The the whole idea of this commission is not to have preconceived ideas and preconceived uh, objectives other than uh, either reform, as some people said they don't want, or actual uh, systemic change that is quantifiable and actual. And in order to actually to do that, we need we need the education that everyone suggests we should get. And I would appreciate uh, in any of those people who who uh, feel that they are unique holders of unique information should be, I would encourage them to, to reach out to a counselor, reach out to the council president, reach out to uh, the administrative assistant, Laura Krutzler, indicate your interest in any way. And that would be, that would be honestly greatly received. And then hopefully, um, hopefully we can look forward to the, the hard work that this committee is going to do, and this commission is going to do, and hopefully it will serve us well. Um, to sort of to that, sorry, Councilor Labarge, I see it went quickly. Um, there are nine appointments for the council, but that takes into account that two of those are counselors that are being appointed. So there really are seven additional ones. And if even if I take myself out of the equation for choosing someone, there still leaves one person out. Um, I thought of this, I thought of every iteration, believe me. Um, so that's my concern. I'll be very honest. My another concern is that if if there are, you know, if 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 a counselor puts forward a great candidate, but then another counselor puts forward a candidate who's a person of color and has an amazing lived experience, and I don't, um, you know, I I don't I don't want to have to feel like we need to fit into ward slots necessarily. If there are if they're going to be applicants who have more important relevant experience and or if they're um if it's going to be the difference between having another person of color on the commission that's one of my concerns councillor labarge you've been waiting patiently that's fine thank you um as you know councillor um Shira, i have been working with several people in ward six who are professional social workers and we've been doing a tremendous amount of research and they can't wait until the applications come out because we're talking about this a lot. And um, I think we're going in the right direction. We did hear people ask about having a commission put in place, if not another um, committee being put in place. 
I think this is the beginning of what we've been hearing through many, many budget hearings. I also feel that we're looking at a change here that we have heard many, many people say. I would like to have some information clarified of the phone calls that I've been getting and hearing from people is that why did we go ahead at from the 15% then down to the 10%? And also, why was that decision made first before even having a plan put in place? I'm also hearing difference of a figure, and I'd like you, Councilor Shearer, tonight, right now, if you can possibly, come out with the amount of the, from the police department, how many of the training um, police officers are going to be not coming to Northampton. I'm getting different figures on that, which I really think this needs to be explained to the public. And exactly how many police officers, Councilor Shera, okay, are also leaving the police department. It's out there and it's not the right figures. Um, thank you, Councilor Labarge. I'm, I'm not sure why I would be the person at this moment to be able to answer that question. Yes, but, I, but, but first, I, I, I need us to be very clear that right now, what's on the floor is this resolution for a commission. So we're not talking about the budget. We're not talking about past votes. What we're talking about is this resolution. I for understand the that, so but that's not. That's I, not I know where you're coming at, but it is a commission here. But this is being brought up of why are we going into this with how many police officers that we already got rid of versus putting in a commission. I mean, it's out there of why we're doing this when we already went and took police officers off their jobs. So I just want to get it clarified somehow why we're doing this commission. Do you know where I'm coming at? Because uh, we're saying we jumped at it too quick, but I don't feel we did because we heard voices out there telling us to put something in place. Okay. Um, uh, Counselor, um, Counselor Dwight. Yes. Um, it's, it, 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 we have to be very careful. This is not an agenda item and we can't discuss this at this point. I would recommend that the counselor have any requests that she um, make them directly to the mayor outside in, in, in the form of an email or a phone request. It's not, it, it is out of order as a discussion here on this agenda because it is not an agenda item. That means the public never had an opportunity to know that this would be discussed. And we, and I think we have to be very careful about abiding by the letter and the spirit of open meeting law. Um, in so far as we know, the level of scrutiny. So I, I would just caution everyone as we proceed to discuss any of these things, we make sure they're pertinent and relevant to the items that we're addressing, and not, not any more than that. Thank you. Councilor Jarrett. Um, thank you. Um, so going back to the question, um, so I, I'm he, here's my concern around the appointment process is not what that I don't you know is is how um, is is what a, a lack of clarity on what it will be, and I hear that you are talking with the attorney general's office um, and hopefully we'll have that clarity but um, it's when it says that the review process will be determined by each appointing authority I hearing now that that essentially means the council president will decide that review process is that correct I don't know the attorney general will tell me <laughs> okay I, I, I you know I mean I'll I'll you know what I had proposed last time, which was that um, I would 
I, in conjunction with the two counselors that were would be chosen for the commission, would would complete that review process and pick the appointees. Mm -hmm. I have am being told that that is not potentially not possible. So, or probably not possible. So and, that's the information I have. And how will the two members be chosen? I will choose them. Okay, that that yeah. is. That I needed clarity on. Yes. Um, okay, that, that helps clarify. And I guess I just want to give a comment that I'm so glad that now the council is voting on this. I think in the future, it needs to be clear from the beginning of the process that, you know, the, that, that we will vote to establish something like this. You know, with the select committee, we have a process. Um, and to refer to what Councillor Dwight said, yes, the council president appoints standing committees and appoint select committee members, but it's not clear um, with, for joint commissions. There's nothing in our mm -hmm. rules about that. So I think it's fair to, 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 to talk about this and to, to have an understanding. Um, and yeah, so that just to, to those points. Thank you. Sure, Councilor Dwight. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So just to be clear, actually, the rule is, and I'll read it, actually, the, uh, the president shall appoint all members of committees of the city council, whether special or standing. The president shall have the same powers to vote upon measures coming before the city councils and the other member of the city council of the ship. The president shall perform any other duties consistent with the office that are established by charter, ordinance, or other vote of the council. So what in fact is all committee appointments that are come under the aegis of being council appointments are by our rules and that those rules are subject to change but at the beginning it, when we convene for the first time each year when we assemble but right now those are the rules that we agreed on and voted on and that is the those are the conditions by which we have done all previous appointments just to be clear oh i'm sorry and i'm getting a correction <laughs> It's the charter. I'm sorry. It's not the rule. It's not. That's the charter, and even bigger. Uh, that's even more. Uh, that that carries more authority than our rules. Um, so that is uh, that's actually the language from the charter. So, just, so that said, I think the council president is is working very hard to try and be as inclusive and to solicit input from as many. Um, Possible, many avenues as possible. The other, and also to the point about, you're right. I mean, actually the development of this committee was, has been fast, but you'll, you'll remember the, the impetus for this as it developed, it's, it's, it's unusual. It is in response to um, a, a public outcry and also a prolonged debate and discussion on other issues relative to the issue of policing in the city of Northampton. Um, normally, these things percolate longer. They come into sponsorship of counselors or recommendations of counselors, or they're usually by citizen petition and so on and so forth. So this, the, we are, as I said, we're, we're in extraordinary times, moving in an extraordinary timeline with an extraordinary amount of responsibility and, uh, and, and uh, pressure here. So, so I just wanted to be, I did want to be clear that actually there, there's really not any ambiguity here as to who is the appointing authority ultimately for committees. Garrett. Thank you for that clarification. Um, yeah, that I, I didn't think to look in the charter for that. I was just looking at our rules. Um, so that that's that is the sort of clarification that, that I feel like I needed um, to, un, to understand the process. So thank you uh, both for that. Thank you. I mean, I'm, uh, I'll just say as an aside, um, you know, I accept the responsibility because it's my responsibility, but um, I'm a collaborative person and I like to work collaboratively. So I don't necessarily, while I accept it and honor it, I don't relish it. And I would rather do this with other people and, and have a conversation. Um, I just may legally not be able to. Uh, Councillor Quinlan. Got it? Is, it? is it popping up and saying, ask to unmute? 
There it is. Okay. Well, I just um, <clears throat> I wanted to just say that that like like all of the counselors, um, you know, I've received comments from from people and a couple of really very thoughtful emails, specifically from people uh, kind of challenging the idea of the commission concerned about the future. Um, of the commission and enacting what the commission's findings may be. Uh, of course, there was one uh, person that that was very forceful in their email, really assertive language used to, to say that they, they've they already given us the information. We heard some people say that tonight. And I feel like that's true. We do have a lot of information, but we don't know how that information applies to the city of Northampton specifically and how we do that. And that's what I'm looking forward to this commission doing and being. Uh, I'm really, uh, you know, the other thing that I would say, and I, and I wrote this to everyone that, that, that asked me about this and, and questioned the, the value of this commission is that, you know, I wouldn't dream that, that any of us should be trusted blindly. I would, you know, think that accountability is going to be greatly important in this. Um, you know, really six uh, and then, you know, seven counselors uh, were very comfortable with a, with a budget cut of some sort for the police department. And I think that should show that the, the, the idea of, of looking at how we respond to emergencies in our city, um, looking at how we um, provide social emergency services and so forth uh, is something that this council's already taken seriously. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that people will will gain some trust with the commission. I agree. I think it was Councillor Foster that said before we, we, we're going to work to build some trust here. Uh, and, you know, lastly, I just want to say that that I do support the commission as I as I have since since June 4th, when we talked about it, I think the very first time uh, in some of our comments. Uh, so uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Counselors. Councillor Jarrett. Um, I just wanted to speak generally uh, about, and thank you, Councillor Quinlan, um, for that analysis. Um, so I have and very much appreciated the work that the mayor and the council president have done to incorporate uh, our suggestions. Um, I am going to support the resolution and the commission. I think because we have a strong mayor form of government, I don't think we're going to get much done in this area if we don't work together. However, historically, if we look at commissions like this in the past, there's not a good track record at making change. Um, so we, we are going to need continued public support to ensure that we take action on the recommendations. And I, I think as Councillor Quinlan said, we are, um, you know, we as a council have shown that we are in, engaged and want and want to look at the at alternatives here. Um, I did want to bring up one issue which wasn't addressed. Um, and that's the issue of stipends for service and how that would enable more people to have the resources to participate um, in the conversation. And um, I understand that this is a larger issue. Uh, this is a larger conversation. It deserves its own select committee or commission to think about the issue of compensation for the for primarily volunteer work uh, that, that our boards and commissions are. Um, in my work with the housing partnership, we explored the idea of civic participation grants, which would be partnering with a local nonprofit to give grants to those who would qualify. Um, so I'm interested in exploring this as a sh shorter term solution uh, where uh, outside of the city, uh, someone who wanted support in participating in this commission could could apply. So if anyone is interested in uh, working with me on that, please, please contact me in one, the public or the council. Um, and um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that that offer. Okay. Oh, Councilor Mary. Hold up. Yes, I'm muted. Um, yeah, I just wanted um, to say that I am glad that we're voting on this. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I respect the work the mayor and the council president put into the forming the commission. And I understand this type of you know, joint effort is unusual. So the process was fat and was fast as well. So things weren't necessarily clear. I, I do feel like after counselors have spent like parts of two meetings thoughtfully amending the joint commission document with no knowledge of the future ability to vote on it, you know, it just doesn't sit right with me to 
to vote on it with with that you know what what feels like a little bit after the fact um, and so for this vote I will be respectfully abstaining um, but I am heartened by all the watchful eyes on the commission and the amazing brain trust in this community to draw from I appreciate Councillor Quinlan's comments about accountability. Uh, and I thank the mayor and President Shiera for the, being responsive to our suggestions and amendments to the, the Joint Commission document. I, um, I'm, I'm at this point quite hopeful about what we can accomplish here because I think there's a lot of motivation and I think it's exciting. And I am committed uh, to supporting and helping the commission to succeed, whether in a formal or informal role. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, Councilor LaBarge. Thank you. I'll say it again. As a city councilor, I am very pleased in the direction we are putting in place a Northampton Policing Review Committee. We are definitely going in the right direction with both branches of our government working together, hearing the many voices in our city of change and our police department to study the complex issues that have been brought to our attention, which is very, very valuable here. We heard it, we've got this commission that we're gonna be supporting, and I really feel that people will be able to work together and our city, our city will be able to work together with this new commission coming in place. And many people are very interested in being part of this commission to help make our city what it is, what it is, and to be vibrant, safe, and even visitors coming into our city. So I know it's gonna be a lot of hard work, but I know it can be done. And we do have the many residents in our city who are very, very happy that this is being in place. And I support this 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nash. Sorry, unmuted. Okay, so um, I, I'd like to thank both the mayor and Councillor Sheriff for pulling this together. Uh, this, uh, this is really terrific work on short notice. It, um, and I, I remain very hopeful about the work that this commission can produce. Yeah. I am looking forward to the results. Um, I, I, I appreciate that the timelines set in place are matching up with our budget process, with our budget planning process, that we are clearly going to move on things here. And, um, and so I, I'm hopeful and I want to thank the council president and the mayor for pulling this together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further hands, Mayor Narkowitz, anything you'd like to add? No. Okay. Um, Laura, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Nope, sorry, wait, hold on, okay. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Abstain. Okay. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Move to suspend rules, please, to allow for a second reading. Second. Motion is made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Foster to suspend rules. Any discussion on suspension of rules? Hearing none, roll call on suspension of rules, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. And oh, oops. You're muted. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. 
Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Move to approve. Second. Second reading's been motion for second reading's been made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Um, any discussion on second reading? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Jane. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, that passes into readings. Um, moving next, we go to the consent agenda. I will read the titles of the items and then I'm going to ask if there are any removals for discussion as there's no discussion on items on the consent agenda. So first we have the minutes of June 3rd, 2020 for the budget hearing and June 25th, 2020 for the special meeting. Uh, next item is 20.084 applications for junk dealer licenses. There's a, these are renewal licenses for Richard and Sharon Huntley, 254 East Hampton Road. The petitioner is Richard Huntley. And for Norman E. Maynard, 25 Garfield Avenue, petitioner is Norman E. Maynard. Next is 20.085 petitions for second hand, second annual second hand dealer licenses. These are renewal licenses for Antiques Corner at 81 Loudville Road. The petitioner is Lewis M. Farrick, Cancer Connection Thrift Shop at 375 South Street. There is Christine Quinn. The Family Jewels at 56 Green Street. Petitioner is Richard J. Stone. Norman E. Maynard, 25 Garfield Avenue. Petitioner is Norman E. Maynard. Uh, Sassy Pants, Vintage and Used Clothing at 2 Con Street, Unit 2. Petitioner is Kathleen uh, Monolongowski. In Urban Exchange, 233 Main Street. Petitioner is Sylvia Naumberger. Next is 20.086, an application for business owner's permit. Jeffrey D. Miller for Cosmic Cab company. And next, these are uh, 20.097 appointments to various committees. These are all reappointments to the Board of Registrars, Daniel Polachek, 335 South Street, uh, term April 2020 to March 2023. Downtown, to Downtown Business Architecture Committee, Alan Tierney, 30 Francis Street, term is July 2020 to June 2023. To the Human Rights Commission, Booker Bush, MD, 119 Pine Street in Florence. Term is July 2020 to June 2023. License Commission, Helen Kahn, 188 Federal Street in Florence. Term is July 2020 to June 2026. To the Parks and Recreation Commission, James Ryan, 56 Leonard Street in Leeds. Term is July 2020 to June 2023. Those are the Move items. Approval. And move, move approve, and I also want to commend Laura for her heroics on uh, generating the minutes of those meetings. It's absolutely <laughs> astonishing, but yes. For real. A lot of work. Thank you. Laura. Also worth noting is that those appointments to various committees are actually for referral to city services. That's what we're actually moving. Right. Yes. You didn't the, mention that it was for referral, so. I know it didn't, it's not, it doesn't say it on here, but that is, those are for referral for city exactly. services. Um, those are all reappointments, but they're still, they get referred to city services. Um, so there are no removals, right? So the motion has been made and seconded. Um, Laura, when you're ready, please roll call. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Hold on, wait, different mouse. Hold on. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Wait. Oh. You're not muted, but I can't hear you. No. No. Is he mouthing up? Messing with us. Yeah, is he messing with me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, you are messing with me? Or yes, you approve the consent agenda? Okay. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. And Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Okay, next, hold on. 
Scrolling, scroll. Okay, next we are going to recess for the finance committee. And oh, I got to scroll all the way to the top of this agenda. Okay, um, Laura, when you're ready, can you please call the roll of finance, please? Sure. Councillor Shara. Yes, here. Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Okay. Uh, first item is more minutes. Um, this is approval of minutes from the previous meeting, which was June 18th. So is there a motion on approving these minutes? Move to approve. Second. Motion has been made by Councilor LaBarge and seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Um, any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. And Councilor Thorpe. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <coughs> um, our first financial order is 20.083, in order to approve issuance of refunding bonds. And this is in the city council, July 9th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, 20.083, in order to approve issuance of refunding bonds, ordered that in order to reduce interest costs, the treasurer, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to provide for the sale and issuance of refunding bonds pursuant to chapter 44, section 21A of the general laws or pursuant to any other enabling authority at one time or from time to time to refund all or any portion of the city's general obligation bonds outstanding as the date of adoption of this order. And that the proceeds of the refunding bonds issued pursuant to this order shall be used to pay the principal redemption premium and interest on the bonds of the city to be refunded and cost of issuance of the refunding bonds. And that any premium received by the city upon the sale of any refunding bonds approved by this order, less any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this order in accordance with chapter 44, section 20 of the general laws. And, okay, uh, is there, a, can I get a motion? Take a motion. Second. Motion, second. Motion's been made by Councilor Barge, seconded by Councilor Thorpe, and I see the mayor here. You see the unmute thing? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Council President, and um, to the members of the Finance Committee. Um, this is a language that's been prepared by our Bond Council. Um, uh, we obviously, you know, that we um, we uh, issue municipal bonds to pay for um, debt on capital projects and other expenditures, and um, we have a potential opportunity to essentially refinance um, some of that debt. Um, we last did this in 2015 uh, when we had the opportunity. Uh, we had some bonds that were coming up and were eligible uh, to um, for this refunding process. Um, and at that point, we were able to save significantly on um, on interest rates by refunding them. It's very similar to someone who might refinance their their home, their mortgage, in order to take advantage of a lower rate. Obviously, we have a lower rate environment right now, um, and Bond Council um, has advised that we should prepare ourselves um, to be ready in September, uh, early September, um, that if those rates remain favorable, uh, that we would, um, we would go through that process. So essentially, this is language that just um, authorizes the city to do that. Um, we, we actually took a vote like this back in 2015, um, but some, some language and some laws have changed since then. So out of an abundance of caution, we wanted to bring the vote back forward again. Um, and we're asking for two readings because again, we want our bond council to be able to prepare and lay the groundwork. Um, and you'll, your next meeting isn't until late August. And so we wanted to get two readings on this tonight. Um, we believe, and again, these are just estimates that um, that the bonds that would become eligible um, in the fall for this refunding um, that we could potentially, you know, be able to save about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars in interest payments over like a nine-year period. Um, again, those are just estimates from our bond council. We you know, won't know until we know what the actual interest rate is at the time. Um, so that's what this is for, um, and. Uh, and I would appreciate uh, the, the positive recommendation of the finance uh, committee and hopefully 
the city council. Okay, thank you. Councillors. Uh, Councillor Thorpe and then Councillor Quinlan. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for being here. Is, is this um, happening now because there's a decline in interest rates? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, we're we're seeing that interest rates are low right now. I know lots of people are refinancing mortgages, and so um, uh, so it's a it's it's definitely a combination of that environment. Obviously, we don't know what if that environment will continue and what it will be looking like in September, but we want to be prepared um, in case uh, in case it does happen. Yeah. Thank you. And, and with refunding bonds, it's um, um, somewhat accurate that a bond that retires another bond before the first bond retire, uh, met matures. Is that correct? I, with missed refunding the bond, it's, it's I, missed, I missed the last part of your question. With refunding bonds, it's a, a bond that retires another bond before the first bond matures? Uh, yes, I believe that's probably an accurate description. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. There's, a, there's every bond has like a callable period when and so when that period comes around, that's the opportunity that you have to be able to um, seek this refunding uh, bond. Yeah. Thank you. It was Councillor Quinlan. Three. Yeah, I just I just had a question about the the order itself um, because I note here that it says um, at one time or from time to time. Uh, so I'm wondering, does this have a shelf life? This specific uh, order uh, is this something that the city council and the finance committee vote on every year? Or is this something that would just that we vote on tonight and it's it's in place uh, some somewhat permanently? Well, what I um, as I said before, um, it, it it had last been voted on um, or some language similar to this in 2015, um, but some of those mass general laws have changed since then, and there have been some uh, modernization act related to how bonds are calculated, um, and so our bond council. Um, out of an abundance of caution, thought we should come back and have this language. Um, but again, I guess I would just stress that you know I don't. This would I don't know that any um, any mayor would would refinance unless there was going to be a savings to the city. So I, I don't know that there's a great financial risk here. I, I can't imagine a mayor, future mayor, refinancing to get a higher interest rate. Um, so, um, so again, we, we rely on professional counsel from our bond council who, you know, um, follow the bond market very carefully and follow interest rates and, and they, they are always looking at for these types of opportunities. So, um, so yeah, I think it, this would, um, until there, unless and until there was some other change or, you know, um, that it would probably allow us to do that um, going forward. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> okay. Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Sh Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. That moves forward with a positive recommendation. Next, next is twenty point zero eight seven which is an, whoops, it opened over there for some reason, hold on one sec. It is an order to, it's in the city council, July 9th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor planning sustainability and planning board, in order to approve spending to complete the Northview subdivision. Whereas the planning board has ordered the calling of the financial performance guarantee lenders agreement on the Northview subdivision at Village Hill because of the failure of the developer owner to complete the subdivision in accordance with the subdivision plans and whereas the planning board also holds the covenants on two lots as an additional performance guarantee and whereas Northfield Northview subdivision needs additional grading site stabilization drainage sidewalk asphalt and related work to complete the project and whereas the city will only fund improvements to the extent those improvements are funded from the financial performance guarantees and the release of covenants ordered that Northampton City Council in accordance with the subdivision control law, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 41U, Section 81U, and the Northampton subdivision regulations authorizes the expenditure of performance guarantee funds to meet the costs and expenses of the city in completing the work as specified in the approved plan and to refund remaining funds, if any. Okay. Move. 
to move with a positive recommendation. The motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Um, I see. I can Wait. speak to it, and I, I'm not sure if Director Fiden's here. He may yeah. not be able to add to that. Um, um, you actually heard some from someone in public comment who actually made reference to this issue in this project, and um, and again, this is a performance bond on the public utilities that were part of this subdivision uh, requirement. Um, we uh, so, uh, but if Mr. Fiden's here, he he has much greater uh, detailed knowledge of this, and um, I would defer to him to give you a, a, a more expanded explanation. Mr. Fiden. Sure. Um, I think you've gotten most of the points. I mean, this, this was a failed subdivision. This doesn't happen often, but it certainly happens from time to time. Um, the developer failed. Um, the developers left holding five lots um, and a Florence Bank holds a mortgage on them. I assume Florence is going to foreclose, but I don't really know that for sure. Um, there are, you know, several different permits, the site plan approval, the stormwater permit, and there's a subdivision permit. The performance guarantee we hold just has to do with the stormwater permit. Um, and so the reason we're asking for two readings is the site was stable, but now literally every time it rains, there's more and more damage happening to the site. So we'd like to move as quickly as possible to stabilize the site um, because it does become more expensive over time as, as the erosion is actually causing problems. Um, and so it's a state law creates pretty strict rules for this process. Um, so there's a, a requirement. We had to release certain funds at certain points in the project. So we hold as much money as we possibly can. Um, what we do that's over and above what almost every other city does is in addition to the performance guarantee, the financial performance guarantee, we also hold covenants on two lots. So that puts us in a much better position than most communities are. Most communities, when a subdivision fails, they hold a certain amount of money back. But in addition, you know, even though we don't own those two lots and can't do anything with it, the uh, developer is pretty, or the, the, the owner is pretty motivated to work with us going forward. Um, we hope there's enough money to do everything in the project, but we don't know that it's too early in the process. What actually has to be done is the stormwater, as I said, to stabilize the site and then things from getting worse. Uh, uh, I see Councilor Zabarz and Councilor Foster. Um, when, when I had called you today, because I was looking at this very, very carefully, and if I can recall about 15 years ago, possibly 14 or 15 years ago, we had something similar like this. And I think, Councillor Dwight, if you can recall Avis Circle, we had serious problems there. And Wayne, you were involved with neighborhood meetings with us and also at that point with the director of the Department of Public Works. And looking at the contractor himself, who is the builder and so forth, the properties of the surveying was not completed. And also on the boundary lines. And then when I looked at this, and I said, are we running into the same problem? But I remember when I went into the planning board as a city councilor for all the residents on Ava Circle, because uh, I knew that the contractor or the builder had to place money in the planning board. That is a procedure you do, correct? They have to deposit? Yeah, either an escrow or a letter of credit or third party agreement, but in some form or other, correct? And I had asked the planning board to not release that letter of credit until all that survey and work was completed there and the boundaries were put in place and you were there in full support of it also. And I can see what's happening here, you know, and hearing that resident tonight speaking, it's almost, but it's a little bit worse there than it was here. And, um, I'm, I'm going to support this 100% because they're going to need all the help they can get. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I've worked through three recessions in my time in Northampton, and every recession we've had some failures. Um, I have to say, what, we're in a much better position now than we were two recessions ago because we had a lot of bank failures. 
-hmm. And so we had projects that potentially could have lost both the bank and the developer. In this case, even the developer failed, the performance guarantee is solid, there's no risk of losing that. Thank you, Wayne. So Foster. I thank you. Um, so this is in Ward 2, um, and I had a chance to meet with um, the residents of Northview. They spent about an hour with me on Tuesday night showing me around and directed by night. I understand you had a chance Sunday morning. Um, you really took a look around. And, and I have some questions. Um, so of course, I, I will support this, but I, I just wanted to kind of move a few things forward. The, the letter that was read during public comment, that was actually signed by um, 22 residents um, from Northview. They um, have been working really hard, um, both to, to mitigate stormwater runoff on their own, as well as to, to pull together um, you know, as a group to, um, you know, to find solutions. And so some questions I have for you. Um, with, with mass development and the city, you know, kind of um, helping to move this process forward, I understand that the homeowners will have a homeowners association, or that was the plan when all the lots were sold. But now that all the lots aren't sold, the the homeowners association consists of the developer who is no longer working on this project and is and uh, is filed um, for the the state level equivalent of bankruptcy. So, what recourse do the homeowners have to sort of move forward with forming that association? Is there any recourse? So, that's actually a private contractual agreement that the city is not a party to. Um, so, because we we have nothing to do with the rules and when the oh form or don't form. There are five lots that are still owned um, by Sturbridge Development and they are, Florence Bank has mortgages on all of them um, and there's a lot of value in those lots. So at some point, I mean, so I guess there's two models. One is the developer can release those lots and say, yes, we're or turn this over. You guys can form the Homer Association now that they, they have the right to change that. Or at some point those lots can go forward. And, and be developed and be sold. And, and then, the, then there's a th an existing threshold um, that turns control of the home association to the current property owners. Okay, and with the city holding covenants on those lots, does that mean the city could potentially bring in more income to help fund the improvements that are needed in that area? Yeah, so there are there's, there's five permits on the property. Mm -hmm. They all have some thresholds in terms of when the city releases them. Um, so, um, so the city has some leverage there, everybody who needs a certificate of occupancy, and there's still five lots that need, need home, need, you know, the homes haven't been completed yet. And so they're going to need certificates of occupancy. The city has covenants on two lots. So we're going to have to release those lots at some point. Um, there's stormwater permits. So there's a lot of, frankly, leverage points in the process going forward. We are limited by state law as to what we can do, but we're going to look at all the leverage points going forward in the process. Okay, because I really get the concern that the lack of improvements on the private lots are contributing to the the difficulty with the stormwater runoff that um, you know that that so much of the the sediment and silt and things like that that are running and, and clogging up the system are actually coming from private lots and this and. If, if I understood you from our phone call the other day, the city doesn't have the ability to work on the city lots or, it, or can the city have recourse there to, to shore up those private lots that are now sitting empty and contributing to this problem? So there's two issues. Okay. First one is at this point, we have no right to go onto the property. They're, they're privately owned property. Um, the owners may well beg us to go on the property because you know their, their value, the value of their lots are going down every day. So they may be happy to grant the second thing is, I guess maybe it's three things. The second thing is the monies we have are specifically about guaranteeing the subdivision, not about guaranteeing compliance with stormwater regulations or compliance with site plan approval standards. Um, and so we have to be careful in terms of how we use the money that we're holding in trust for the, for the property owners to ensure the work gets done. Um, and the third, of course, is this is the leverage point issue. If we use our limited funds, we may be leaving other money on the table. So the owner of those lots or the mortgage holder, if, if the mortgage is foreclosed on, we would like them to invest in stabilizing their lots. If we start spending, you know, so we're getting immediately a $208,000 payment. That's what the, the 
uh, performance guarantee was for, the financial performance guarantee. If we start using those funds to stabilize lots, which absolutely need it, no question about that, then we're going to have less money to do the other things that are needed. So that's sort of the assessment that we do. We're obviously working with, with our legal counsel. You know, if there's a way to set, spend the funds to stabilize the property and put a lien so we can recover the funds for, you know, sidewalks, for example, are not a top priority, but they should get done at some point. So, so I think we're looking at all those things, but we are not going to, we're not just going to spend money and then not have a, and let a, a property owner off the hook. And then what role does, does mass, is mass development totally out of the picture with this now? Or, or is there some leverage with mass development to help this as well? Yeah, as far as I know, they're out of, out of, out of it. There's a new, the, the woman we've been working with for many years, the project manager, she retired recently. We met with the new project manager just on Friday and she was going to do research on that. So I don't know the answer. The neighbors have told me that mass development has a recapture agreement. They can take over lots of it fails, but again, we're not party to that. So we don't hold any, uh, any performance guarantee with them. There is some erosion coming off the um, northeasterly corner, one of the places where there's a large beech tree, and that's on property that Mass Development still owns. That's a pretty, it's a very small contributing factor, but that's clearly gonna be their responsibility um, for doing it. But other than that, as far as I know, they're off the hook, but again, we haven't done that sort of legal review yet. Okay. And then, um, so just to be clear, so the priorities that you're identifying are the the stormwater, the shoring up, um, and and addressing that first with with the two hundred eight thousand dollars that's available. Um, and then, do you anticipate there will be money left over? Or I, I know that's hard to pin down without getting quotes. Or do you right. do you anticipate that that's, that's it? But I can say a year ago. The developer, when you know, the developer was doing fine and their engineer presented cost estimates to the city of the cost for finishing the project and DPW reviewed those and thought those were realistic and that's the $208,000. So a year ago, we thought there was enough money. Um, some prices go up over time, some prices go down over time. One of the real wild unknowns is what's happened underground. There is a large drainage facility underground that's protected by a silt sock. If silt has made it through that silt sock and is damaging the facility and has to be dug up, then you can start spending money quickly. If the project is the normal course of things, you build things and it becomes less expensive, um, then there should be enough money to do it. So that, that's really the wild card uh, in the process. Okay, so um, I guess the, just what I would advocate with this is that the residents um, who live there are going to be the ones eventually legally responsible um, for for all of this, and um, I, I just want to advocate that their voices are part of this planning and um, moving forward with it. Um, you know, and we can talk offline out of this meeting um, to schedule a time, um, you know, to meet with them and, and make sure that that they're uh, involved with how it is moving forward. Uh, just recognizing that they're the ones who are legally and financially responsible for this when it's done. I I just really want to make sure that they're included in this process. Yeah, I mean, so it's clear that that's been very important to us. So as, as you mentioned, I walked the site on Sunday with neighbors. We had a hour conversation yesterday with neighbors. Um, we are interviewing an engineer for, for hiring on, I think tomorrow actually, and we've invited three neighbors to come just for the beginning of the meeting to sort of give their view to the engineer. So very much the neighbors are gonna be on the table because they have their own obligation already under permits beyond the storm, beyond the uh, subdivision permit. They're not gonna be making the final decision because we can't release that, but absolutely neighbors need to be at the table at every step of the way. Thank you, Director Biden. Other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, roll call on a positive recommendation, please. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation. Next is 20.088 in order to authorize payment of prior year bills. Uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor ordered that the council authorize payment of the following prior year bills totaling eight, uh, I assume that should be a comp, no, $872.18. So central services 
to Hodge City Plumbing for FY19, $220.86. Central Services Hodge City Plumbing, FY18, $206. Central Services Hodge City Plumbing, FY18, $411.86. Central Services WB Mason, FY19, $23.65. Central Services WB Mason, FY16, $9.81. Move to approve, please. Second it. Motion's been made and seconded by Councilor Quinn and Councilor LaBarge on a positive recommendation. Mayor Narkowitz. Thank you. Um, so uh, these are some um, small uh, bills that are from a previous fiscal year um, and be under mass general law. Um, even a bill that is from June um, requires a vote of the council to authorize uh, payment. Um, and so these are a set of five different uh, bills from FY, well, a series of FY uh, fiscal years, um, totaling $872 for services that have been rendered. Um, and so we want to obviously pay them. And, um, and so we just need the authorization to do that because they're in a prior fiscal year. Okay. Any questions or comments? Oh, Councilor Jarrett. Um, yeah, usually we see these as, you know, something that happened in this, the previous fiscal year. I'm just curious why there's some that are, you know, it's like maybe five years old here. I share your curiosity. Um, it's a little, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, occasionally they, you know, some of these are vendors that we work with all the time. Um, like WB Mason is one that we get a lot of our bulk paper purchases from, um, as well as um, Hodge City Plumbing is someone that we've done work with. So um, these sometimes occasionally bills get sent to wrong addresses or bills get uh, rerouted to the wrong city department. Um, and sometimes neither the vendor or the city catches it. And so I don't know the individual stories for each one, but I'm assuming one of us discovered that it had gone unpaid. Um, and so we want to just make sure that we, they probably want to make sure their books are closed and cleared and we want to do the same. So um, that's again, unfortunate, but um, fortunately, like the oldest one is for $9 and 81 cents. So um, I think we're good for it at this point. So we want to make sure we close that. They want to close it off our, their books and we want to close it off ours. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Next is 20.089. Upon the recommendation of the mayor in order to authorize FY 2021 intermunicipal agreements, Ordered that whereas Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 4A allows for joint operation of public activities among governmental units, and whereas Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 4A requires that such intergovernmental agreements be approved in a city by the City Council and the Mayor, and whereas the City of Northampton provides services to and shares services with other municipalities. Therefore, pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 40S, 4A, um, the City Council hereby authorizes the City of Northampton to enter into the following intermunicipal agreements for FY 2020, all agreements for one year unless specifically noted. Contract with Town of Williamsburg for building inspection and zoning enforcement services. Agreement to provide the Town of Williamsburg with services for a lump sum annual fee. Contract with Town of Williamsburg for electrical inspection services. Agreement to provide the Town of Williamsburg with services with permit fees turned over to the City of Northampton. Contract towns of Amherst, Hadley, and East Hampton for municipal hearing officer services. Agreement to pro provide municipal hearing officer services pursuant to Master General Law Chapter 148A, Section 2C, to hear complaints related to alleged violations of state building codes or the state fire codes for a lump sum per the agreement. Contract with the towns of Amherst, Chester, Chesterfield, Cummington, Hadley, Middlefield, Pelham, Williamsburg, Goshen, and Worthington to provide veteran services other officer services. Agreement to provide these services to other various communities with assessments to individual towns per the agreement. 
contract with the towns of Granby, Hadley, Amherst, South Hadley, and East Hampton to provide sealer weights and measures services. Agreement to provide these services to the various communities and assessments to individual towns per the agreement. Contract with the Franklin County Regional Council of Governments to monitor and support the greater Franklin County economic target area. Contract with the Franklin Regional Council of Governments to partner with the City of Northampton through its health department relative to the following contracts. One, to provide services relative to the Hampshire Medical Reserve Corps, and two, to provide emergency management services for the Hampshire Public Health Emergency Preparedness Coalition. Contract with Amherst, South Hadley, Pelham, Ware, Belchertown, and East Hampton agreement to jointly create a coalition called the Hampshire Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative, charged with mobilizing local boards of health, medical providers, educational facilities, social services agencies, community organizers, and others in Hampshire County to, to create sustainable policies, programs, and practices to change community ideas and expectations regarding opioid use and abuse, as well as to reduce the morbidity and mortality rates that result from opioid use and abuse. Pioneer Valley Opioid Data Collaborative, contract with Bay State Health Inc., City of Springfield Department of Health and Human Services, Hamden County DA, Northwestern DA, Hamden County Sheriff's Department, Opioid Task Force, Berkshire Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative, North Quabbin Community Coalition, Partners for a Healthier Community Inc., agreement to work cooperatively to create methods to collect, store, and aggregate data regarding opioid use and abuse in the region with the goal of analyzing trends and identifying short and long-term intervention strategies. Contract with Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, working under the oversight of the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, focused on mosquito surveillance and control. The city, through its health department, participates in this regional effort to assist Western Massachusetts communities with mosquito-related health concerns. Contract with the towns of Amherst and Pelham to seek and accept grants where possible and to otherwise explore the mutual advantages of electricity community aggregation. DART Case Management Database a memorandum of understanding MOU between the police department's healthcare, behavioral health and recovery centers allowing the first responders who respond to an overdose communicate to the outreach teams in the municipality in which the persons reside, thereby triggering a DART outreach. Partners, Hampshire County Police Departments, Amherst, Beltertown, Chesterfield, East Hampton, Goshen, Granby, Hadley, Hatfield, Northampton, Plainfield, South Hadley, Southampton, Ware, Williamsburg, Amherst College. Massachusetts State Police, Hamden County Police Departments, Chicopee, East Longmeadow, Ludlow, Palmer, Longmeadow, West Springfield, Westfield, Wilbraham, Behavioral Health Network, CSO, Gundara, Northampton Recovery Center, Western, Ma Western MA Training Consortium, Ware Recovery Center, the Nest Recovery Center, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, Bay State Health Systems, Holyoke Medical Center, Mercy Trinity Health Systems, Hampshire County Jail, and House of Corrections. Health Information Exchange for the enhancement of the regional capacity for timely and comprehensive data collection to improve data efficiencies, cost saving and improved service delivery for by expanding our regional public health data capabilities. Partners, Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, Franklin Regional Council of Governments, Opioid Task Force, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Hampshire County Police Departments, and Amherst, Belchertown, Chesterfield, East Hampton, Goshen, Granby, Hadley, Hatfield, Northampton, Plainfield, South Hadley, Southampton, Ware, Williamsburg, Amherst College, MAC Police, Hamden County Police Departments, Chicopee, East Longmeadow, Ludlow, Palmer, Longmeadow, West Springfield, Westfield, Wilbraham, Behavioral Health Network, CSO, Gandara, Northampton Recovery Center, Western Mass Training Consortium, Ware Recovery Center, the Nest Recovery Center, Blue Dixon Hospital, Bay State Health System, Holyoke Medical Center, Mercy Trinity Health Systems, Hampshire County Jail and House Corrections, Northwest District Attorney, Massachusetts Ambulance, Trip Data Matrix, Department of Public Health, Mass Registry of Vital Records, Death Certificate of Data, PDMP slash Mass PAT, PAT, Maven, and other Mass CHIP data and other relevant behavioral health and substance use related data. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, agreement to provide the Planning Sustainability Department the following, Planning Technical Assistance, Traffic and Transportation Analysis, Historic Preservation Planning and Housing Rehabilitation Services through FY 2023. The, hold up. <clears throat> the following agreements currently authorized by the city and have not expired. <coughs> Excuse me. Contract with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for EPA stormwater MS4 permit assistance through March of 2022. Paramatic intercept agreements with, with municipal towns and ambulance districts through November 2041. Contract with Pioneer Valley Transit Authority for Senior Transportation Services through November of 2041. Contract with Greenfield Community College to use one strand of our five college fiber network or an annual fee for the agreement through FY 2022. Contract with the towns of Williamsburg, Goshen, Southampton, and Chesterfield, Huntington, Hadley, and West Hampton, an agreement to provide laser fee hosting services for an annual fee through FY 2022. 
contract with Pioneer Valley Bike Share and to enter an agreement with the cities of West Springfield and Chicopee and the town of Hadley to participate in the Pioneer Valley Bike Share program along with the following entities, which are already part of the existing intermunicipal agreement for the program Holyoke, Springfield, Amherst, South Hadley, UMass, PVPC, and East Hampton already approved through FY 2021. Contract to participate in the Connecticut River Task Force with the police departments of East Hampton, Hadley, South Hadley, Chicopee, and Northwestern District Attorney and partners with the Massachusetts Environmental Police to enhance law enforcement efforts on the Connecticut River due to the heavy volume of boating activity within the regional boundaries of the adjacent agencies. Three-year contract agreement to, to May of 2022. Agreement for fiber optic cable with Five College Net LLC. Agreement to allow the city use of four strand of, of the cable network including the right to transport and distribute digital signals for data. Renewal for, of agreement for five years from, F, from tw uh, 2019 to 2024 and allowing for automatic renewal for another five years from 2024 to 2028. Agreement to participate in the Domestic Violence Intervention Project, a regional partnership formed between the Northwestern District Attorney's Office, Safe Passage, the New England Learning Center for Women in Transition and Area Police Departments, four-year agreement to December of 2022. We're going to participate in the Northwestern District Anti-Crime Task Force with all communities and their representative law enforcement entities within the jurisdiction of the Northwestern District, which are within the jurisdiction of the Northwestern District Courts and that of the Northwestern District Attorney's Office multi-year agreement with no end date. Contract with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and multiple towns for the Mass in Motion Program. Renew for three more years through FY 2022. Public Health Nursing Program contract to partner with the following communities to provide assistance with infectious disease surveillance reporting to the Massachusetts Virtual Epidemiologic Network, MAVEN, for the COVID-19 crisis, Middlefield, Chesterfield, Huntington, Plainfield, Worthington, East Hampton, East Longmeadow, and the Foothills Health District, which serves the towns of Waitley, West Hampton, Williamsburg, and Goshen for FY 2020 and FY 2021. Young Adult Empowerment Collaborative of Western Massachusetts contract to partner with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office, the Opioid Task Force of Franklin County, and the North Quabbin Region, Agreement to work cooperatively to develop and strengthen the regional data system serving your adults, preventing and addressing young adult misuse by creating and promoting evidence-based programming to support, to support young people as they transition into the five stages of adulthood and engaging families and communities in their roles to support young adults for FY 2021 and FY 20, FY 2020 and FY 2021. I think that should say young adults, not your adults. Okay. Move to approve. <laughs> Second. The motion's been made and seconded. I feel like I'm having an out of body experience. Um, okay, Mayor Narkowitz. Yes, this is an annual um, an annual exercise that we do to um, basically uh, renew the um, uh, many of them existing intermunicipal agreements that we have with uh, other communities or sets of communities or or in some cases. Um, combination of communities and agencies um, throughout the region. Um, the last part of the list that was read were are ones that are still in effect, so you're not actually reauthorizing them, but we like to just let people know which ones are already existing. And, um, and again, it's under Mass General Law, we have to reauthorize these every fiscal year. Um, I do think it's a great example of the ways that Northampton does collaborate in the region. Um, and in some cases is a leader in the region. Many of these are things that we lead. Um, everything from you know, bike share to the more recent you know, COVID-19 uh, public nursing initiative. Um, and so um, anyway, I, I would ask for your approval. Um, we are seeking uh, two readings on this um, only because these are um, things that are in effect um, on July 1st. They are sometimes sometimes don't come in to us until late, uh, very late or close to the end of the fiscal year, because in some cases, some of our partners have to have these approved at town meeting. Um, and so town meeting sometimes is late in, in the um, spring. So um, so we're getting these approved and we would appreciate your support. I think uh, Councillor Mayori. Um, yeah, I just have a question. I was just thinking about the commission and uh, what, what might come out of the commission. And does this kind of beholden us to, uh, is there four year contracts starting in 2022? Um, these get renewed every year. Um, okay. In most cases. Right. I just, back, I so. just see the DART and the PV intervention um, project. And I'm just thinking, you know, if, um, if the commission comes out with kind of alternative ways of going about those 
approaching those issues in our community. I didn't know if this kind of how much that we would be able to kind of um, modify this or if this is kind of well, locking us in for four years yeah no most intermunicipal agreements that we sign um, um, have the ability for um, members with obviously notice to the fellow members to withdraw from so, um, so that's always the case you're not bound for a specific set of time sometimes the duration is by a grant um, uh, the the many of the opioid uh, grants. I mean, many of the opioid related ones are funded by either state or federal grants that are multi-year. So no, I don't believe it. This, these will not irreparably lock us into anything if we decide to change. Um, and we do, we have had member communities that uh, pull out of, um, you know, pull out of these collaborative collaboratives and they basically have to give us, you know, enough notice so that we can plan. Um, Cause often these cities and towns are sharing some of the fee structure. So we have to, right enough notice for that so yeah i don't think it does lock us in mayor do they ever modify it i wasn't actually thinking about withdrawal i was thinking about modifying well certainly yeah i mean certainly yeah certainly that's a possibility as well um and okay. that's really something you know if it's something if it's something we're leading but if it's something that's a collaborative then it's a sort of a collaborative decision but yeah certainly okay thank you very much other questions or comments Oh, Councilor Jarrett. Um, definitely see some great collaborations here. Um, and as Councilor Mayori said, there's certainly many that would be appropriate for the Policing Review Commission to review. Um, I was curious on the fiber optic cable with five college net. Um, uh, how is that used? What is that? Um, so, that, um, yeah. So there's a there's a fiber optic network that was basically created a high speed fiber optic network that was created by the five colleges, um, and um, as a as part of that, um, the communities in which the five colleges are located have the ability to um, utilize some of those strands of fiber, and so we Northampton because we are obviously Smith College. Um, is in the five college network. We do have access to that fiber and we do utilize it. Um, and it allows us to be able to um, uh, utilize um, access to the data, the one of the state's two data centers, which is in Springfield. So um, yeah, we do utilize it as a way to um, uh, have access to higher speed um, fiber optic um, network. Yeah. So that's what that's in reference to. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with the positive recommendation. Next is upon the recommendation of the mayor 20, oh, sorry, this one. Uh, next, the next one on the agenda has, uh, there's been a request for its withdrawal. So, um, Mayor, I don't know if you want to speak to it at all, but it's been withdrawn. Um, sure, I can, I, I can just, just give a brief description. Um, this was a project that we've tried, attempted to do um, a couple of times. Uh, this is the treasure collector uh, project where we were going to try to make some construction related modifications to it. Um, we actually bid it out last year and um, and the bids came in uh, much higher than we had anticipated. Um, we decided to rebid the project uh, this summer um, because we'd been getting some very favorable construction bids. Um, and so um, the bids were open today and, um, and we're still seeing that the project is, um, is uh, uh, much more in terms of what we were receiving in bids than we had anticipated. Um, so we're going to take a look at uh, ways to scale down the project, still achieve the goals of the project in terms of you know, achieving um, you know, both the public health uh, safety that's now sort of a new element with COVID-19, but the other elements of security and, and privacy that we were working on um, with this very busy uh, municipal office. It's the, you know, other than the city clerk, it's the busiest office in terms of uh, customers coming in uh, for various services. So 
Um, so we're withdrawing it now, and um, and we'll take a look at um, at ways to uh, to scale back the project to make it more cost effective. I did also just want to point out, and this is actually a question that Councillor Jared had asked me, but somebody mentioned it as well in public comment. Um, this is a project that we're proposing to fund from the stabilization fund, um, which is one of our two uh, uh, stabilization funds that we use for one time, uh, typically uh, one time expenses or one time often sometimes capital expenses. It's not coming from the fiscal stability stabilization fund, uh, which is a separate stabilization fund uh, that's dedicated um, was created to help stabilize and fund operating expenses in the operating budget. So I know that there was some confusion about that. So I just wanted to also make that clarification. So I am, we are not reallocating um, any of the funds from the, or I was not proposing to reallocate funds from the fiscal stability stabilization fund. Um, it's confusing because they're all called stabilization funds under Mass General Law. Um, one's fiscal stability, one's uh, capital stabilization and one is just a generic stabilization fund. So wanted to clear up that as well. So we are withdrawing. Okay, thank you. So next we have upon the recommendation of the mayor 20.091 in order to accept a gift of labor and materials to repair grave of George Podestia. Whereas Historic Gravestone Services of 113 Michael Lane, New Salem, Massachusetts, wishes to provide labor and materials to repair the deteriorated gravestone, George Podestia, formerly enslaved citizen of Florence and resident in Florence, enslaved citizen and Florence resident in Park Street Cemetery, ordered that the Northampton City Council gratefully accepts the donation of labor and materials valued at $500 as a gift to the city of Northampton to be used for the restoration of the gravestone of George Sestia in the Park Street Cemetery in accordance with the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, Grants and Gifts, Acceptance and Expenditure. Thank you, approve. <clears throat> Second. Uh, the motion's been made by Councillor Labarge, and I think was, council was seconded by Councillor Quinlan. Okay. Um, Mayor Narkowitz, will you tell us what you um, there's a couple of orders tonight that involve, uh, in some cases, a donation of um, uh, money to um, cemetery-related projects, and then in another case, um, donation of um, uh, services. And um, in one case, in one, an order that'll come up later, um, uh, the um, David Ruggle Center is donating funds to help um, do some preservation activities on some former slave uh, gravestones in the Park Street Cemetery. Um, this uh, donation actually represents sort of a pro bono gift of the preservationist who's actually doing the work on those other gravestones. And so he, um, he has offered, because he's going to be in Park Street Cemetery doing these other restoration, um, he's offered to basically do the, res uh, the preservation of this particular um, stone. Uh, again, another um, another uh, Florence resident who was a freed uh, slave, a former slave, and um, and so um, so that's the um, that's the uh, what the gift represents. So it's the a, a company that does these gravestone services, donating their services for this one particular gravestone. Mm -hmm. And because it's a gift of either materials or labor, um, we have to accept that as um, needs it requires the city council to accept that gift of labor and materials. Well, I'm certainly grateful for their gift. Yes. Uh, any questions or comments? No, yes, yes, no. I was just gonna say, I, I just love learning about these little snippets of Northampton history, I find it really fascinating. So, thank you. <laughs> okay. Seeing no other questions or comments, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. That moves forward with the positive recommendation. Next is 20.092 upon the recommendation of the mayor in order to accept gift of plaque for grave of Basil Dorsey. Whereas Basil C. Dorsey, 
was born enslaved in 1811, took his freedom on the Underground Railroad in 1833, and lived in Florence, Massachusetts from 1844 until his death in 1872, when he was buried in the Park Street Cemetery in Northampton. Ordered that the Northampton City Council gratefully accept the donation of a plaque to be placed at his grave, valued at $1,000, and donated by Bambi Miller as a gift to the city of Northampton in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, Grants and Gifts, Acceptance and Expenditure. So approved. Second. Motion's been made by Councilor Labarge and seconded by Councilor Thorpe. Mayor Narkowitz. Another um, generous donation from someone. Um, those of you who've ever gone on Steve Strymer's um, tours of Florence will know Basil Dorsey and, um, and, uh, and so again, another uh, former slave who lived in, in Florence. And so this is again, a, um, a memorial gift to erect a plaque and in, in, um, to provide more information about um, Basil Dorsey at his gravesite. Um, do we know if Bambi Miller is a resident of Northampton or from somewhere else? Um, uh, I don't believe she is. Um, she's a, I believe she's a, so someone who's very involved in historic preservation in the area. I don't know for sure if she is. I know she um, formerly was on the Charlemont Historical Commission. Um, I believe she may live in Charlemont, um, but um, um, but it, it has an active interest in um, in in the work that Steve does in the Ruggles Center, and so wanted to be able to um, make this gift. We're very grateful for it. Any questions or comments? Okay, Laura, roll call please on this generous gift. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Move forward with a positive recommendation. Next is upon the recommendation of the mayor, 20.093 and at and 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 uh, order to, I assume to accept um, $3,000 gift from Ruggles Center for Park Street Cemetery gravestone repairs. Whereas the David Ruggles Center, a project of the Committee of Northampton Inc., would like to provide funding for repair work, materials, and professional oversight for repairs for the deteriorated gravestone, gravestones of Basil Dorsey, Laura Washington, Louisa Dorsey, Nancy Jones, and Charles and Gertrude Burley in the Park Street Cemetery. Ordered that the Northampton City Council gratefully appropriates the donation of the $3,000 gift to the city of Northampton be used towards the repair work materials and over professional oversight for repairs for these five grade stones in the Park Street Cemetery in accordance with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 53A, Grants and Gifts, Acceptance and Expenditure. Move to approve. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Mayor Narkowitz. Again, this is part of this series of uh, very generous um, donations um, um, in, re in relation to the Ruggles Center and, and um, the great work they do to preserve the, uh, the history of, of Florence's very important role in the Underground Railroad and, and some of the folks who've lived in our community. And, and so uh, this again is a gift. Um, you're basically giving us the, you're basically giving us the ability to appropriate the funds that have been given to us um, for this purpose, which is obviously what the donors intend the money to be used for. So um, we gratefully accept it and, um, and thank the Ruggles Center for, for the gift. Heartfelt thanks to the Ruggles Center for this gift and, and the work that they do. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Scher. Yes. That moves forward. Positive recommendation. Next is upon the recommendation of the mayor, 20.094, in order to accept gift of hundred up to $100,000 to replace fencing at Bridge Street Cemetery. Whereas in 2016, a preservation master plan was created for the Bridge Street Cemetery and a recommendation within this plan was phased replacement of a cemetery border fence as described on pages 25 to 27. An anonymous donor wishes to provide necessary funding for phase one of this fence replacement above. 
and beyond the city's appropriation of $25,000 for cemetery improvements in FY 2021, ordered that the Northampton City Council gratefully appropriates the donation of a gift to the city of Northampton of funds up to $100,000 be used towards a replacement of approximately 880 linear feet of fence at the Bridge Street Cemetery to include two gates in accordance with the recommendation within the preservation master plan for Bridge Street Cemetery and with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 53A, Grants and Gifts, Acceptance and Expenditure. Oh. Okay. Mayor Norkowitz, anything you want to add on this? So we're moving from Park Street Cemetery to, um, to Bridge Street Cemetery. And back in 2016, we did a preservation master plan. Um, and we've actually completed preservation master plans for um, all three of our historic cemeteries, um, which has helped guide some of the uh, both funding uh, decisions that we've made in our capital program, um, as well as um, uh, allowed us to um, secure grants uh, from uh, Mass Historic and, and the Community Preservation uh, Commission or Community Preservation Act monies um, to do a series of um, restoration efforts at, at, at our three historic cemeteries, Park and Bridge Street and, and West Farms. And so this is actually one of the recommendations out of the study. I don't know if you've um, ever paid attention to the uh, fence when you drive by the Bridge Street Cemetery. Um, it's a pretty, um, uh, it's a, it's a basically a chain link fence. It's clearly not the original fence. Um, and it's, uh, uh, you know, needs a little bit of uh, work and it's obviously not very, um, very pretty to look at when you're driving down uh, Bridge Street. Um, so one of the, one of the recommendations, um, in addition to the, you know, historic restoration of gravestones, et cetera, was to look at um, restoring uh, the fence, or at least installing a, a replica of what a what a fence that would be more appropriate uh, for that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we have have some um, funds in our capital improvement uh, program appropriation, um, and we have a, a generous anonymous donor um, in the community who stepped forward um, and essentially said that they will leverage that $25,000 with up to $100,000 um, to help fund this phase one of the fence replacement. And you know the fence goes all the way around uh, Bridge Street Cemetery. Um, this would just be the, the section um, from sort of Orchard Street and up Bridge Street and then, and then down toward, um, toward uh, the, uh, the side that, that um, borders Lamprin Park and there's some gates in there as well. So um, very generous of this person um, who uh, wants to see this fence replaced. And so again, like the other gifts, we're asking for the authority uh, to appropriate. It says up to 100,000 because we don't have um, an exact uh, price yet on it. Um, we really didn't want to move forward and we typically don't move forward until we have the funding source secured. So um, this is a, gives us authorization of up to $100,000. Right. I want to personally thank this anonymous donor. Um, long before I was a counselor, this um, the fence for um, around the Bridge Street Cemetery has been a sort of a dream project that I've always thought would just bring so much um, if we could replace it with something that was more, more befitting such a historic cemetery and um, closer to what the original would have been. It's such a remarkable cemetery and so beautiful. And that fence is not what should be there. So I, I'm personally thrilled. This is a project that I'm very excited about. Um, and I know Councilor Nash is as well and his hand is up. Yes. Well, thank you, Council President. You very much, pretty much what I want to say. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about how this is an example of lots of pull, people pulling in the same direction. Uh, the mayor's been part of this. Uh, 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 Councilor Labarge has also been our, part of this as well. You'll notice that there was several orders here that had to do with historic re uh, uh, preservation that this discussion has been going on for a number of years and by having these discussions and getting the plans together that when the money becomes available great things can happen as what is ha happening tonight um, 
People I want to thank are uh, Jennifer Norman, Normanly, Bob Reckman, um, and and Martha Lyon for all of their work on the uh, the the master plan for the cemetery. And I also want to thank the anonymous donor for being anonymous. It's it's really kind of funny because you know it's all you know like. Um, Carly Simons, you're so vain. You're always trying to figure out who that person is. Well, in this case, we're trying to figure out who this really great person is. And, and, and in my list of people who might be able to have the resources to do this and really are interested in this project, you know, I can name about 15 or 20 people in town who may, may very quietly be doing this. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and I think that's a great place to be coming from that you know, that we have a lot of neighbors who we feel would be stepping up to the plate. And that, you know, the last thing is we have been stepping up to the plate. We've all been pulling in the same direction. And that this new fence at, at, the, at the cemetery also is gonna complement Bridge Street School. That this is part of a project that the Ward 3 Association has been working on to improve not just the cemetery, but Lamprin Park, the presentation of the school and the approaches to the school so that it's safer for families and children to walk in and get to the school. So um, I'm really excited about this. The donor is the best. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Labarge. Thank you, everybody else. I'll leave it at that. Any other, okay, Councillor Jarrett? Um, yes, seems like a great project. I was curious, it talks about two gates. Will there be access through those gates? Because I know one of the issues with Bridge Street Cemetery is there's only one place you can go in. So if you ever want to use it to as a way, you know, a, a path for walking through, um, you can't. So is there any plan to change that? Um, so the... Um... The gates that are there um, are there are existing gates that are there right now. Um, so we're basically replacing those. Um, I know that some of the um, one of the gates is not open all the time. Um, there's obviously you know there is some challenges here because one of our goals, one of our key missions, um, is providing perpetual care and rest to people that are buried in the cemetery, and so. Um, we do have sometimes some competing interests of people that ostensibly want to walk through, but they um, there's sometimes um, dog waste and other kinds of things that happen as a result of that. But uh, we are definitely looking at the um, at the gates and access and trying to make sure that there's safe access in and out of the cemetery. Um, but these are gates that are existing now that we want to replace and upgrade uh, to make them more historically appropriate. Um, and I know that part of the conversation that the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association has been part of is that balance between wanting to invite the community into the cemetery, but also trying to be respectful of, um, of the purpose of the cemetery and the people that are buried there and the families that have, you know, interned their loved ones there. Thank you. Councilor Nash. Oh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, and uh, Councillor Jarrett, that is one of the um, the goals of the the uh, of the neighbors and the Ward Three Association is to increase the access to this really beautiful piece of property. I, I strongly recommend to people go out there on a beautiful day. And I remember I, I remember meeting uh, with the mayor and director Lascalio about three four years ago out in the middle of the cemetery to discuss you know, the, the, the preservation plan. And it, once you get into the middle of, of, of Bridge Street Cemetery, it's like the rest of the world goes away. It's, it, you, you're in this very uh, rural country uh, setting. It's, it's really quite remarkable. And so one of our goals is to work with the city to have better access and, and also to protect the, the valuable uh, monuments and uh, be respectful uh, as well. So, Councillor LaBarge. Yes, um, thank you, Councillor Nash. Um, 
Yes, we worked pretty hard on all the cemeteries together as a group. I want to also thank all the donors for such wonderful, wonderful, generous gifts. And very, very fortunate at the Bridge Street Cemetery with somebody donating $100,000. That is so appreciative. And I really appreciate of that happening because it is needed. I have relatives who are very and have friends who see change. And I want to thank all the donors. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz? Uh, no, no. I, um, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, just one more comment for Councillor Nash, really. And that's just that, you know, he may have missed the news that. Um, Carly Simon wrote it about Warren Beatty. So just anyway, that's a breaking news for you. <laughs> you heard it here maybe first. I, I'm it. not revealing anything new. It's, it's about a <laughs> year or so old, but yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Any other comments, pop culture, cemetery, otherwise? Nope. Okay, seeing none, roll call, please. I thought I heard the motion from Councillor LaBarge. Was there a second? I no, there wasn't. I didn't hear anybody say second. Okay. A second? I would second. Okay. I think Councillor Quinlan seconded it. Okay. okay. Um, Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. And Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Okay, that moves forward with positive recommendation. Next up is upon the recommendation of the mayor 20.095 an order for FY 2020 budget transfers ordered that the following FY 2020 budgetary transfers be made. Okie dokie. <laughs> From legal services. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm just trying to figure out the best way to read it. Okay, from legal services for legal services, $45,527. Um, transferring to, that it's going there. General liability insurance for public employee liability insurance. Um, it's there, we're, we're take, transferring from there $45,527. For parking maintenance, for equipment, 10,938 transferring to, Parking maintenance, repairs and maintenance, transferring from 10,938. Uh, planning, PS overtime, $6,062. Transferring to IT for overtime, uh, no, for technology communication lines, $10,021. Transferring to um, IT permit salaries, transferring from $16,083. Other employee benefits for Medicare, transferring to $21,300. Other employee benefits, uh, sick leave buyback, transferring to $28,502. Medical insurance, employee insurance benefits, transferring from $49,802. Stormwater enterprise flood control salaries permanent, transferring to $13,000. 254 uh, stormwater enterprise storm drains security services transferring from 7200 uh, storm uh, storm drains again vehicle supplies transferring from 6054 sewer enterprise interest on debt interest on long term debt transferring to $1 and we're taking that dollar from storm drains for a total of um, <clears throat> total budgetary transfers transferring from and to $135,605. Move to approve, please. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. And Mayor Nerkowitz. Yes, um, so this is one of the reasons why we request that the city council hold this July meeting, typically the second, um, week in July is because the, the deadline um, for us to make any final um, uh, transfer in the FY 2020 uh, budget before we close it out is July 15th each year. Um, and so typically as we get cl very close to the end of the year, I know earlier in the spring, 
um, we brought an order to make some initial transfers. Um, and so this is our sort of final um, squaring up of various line items in the budget um, where we either, where we have um, some excesses or some overages and just making sure that we true up um, line items to make sure that they um, are in uh, balance or not in deficit as we close out the FY 2020 budget. So you're not appropriating any new money, um, you're just um, allowing us to move money um, between um, OM and PS line items to make sure that we true that up for the uh, FY 2020 budget, which officially ended June 30th, but we have this 15 day window to make these transfers. Okay, any questions? Oh, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Mayor, could you explain the sick leave buyback? Uh, certainly, um, when we have employees that, um, that uh, retire or leave the service of the city, um, depending upon their um, uh, time with the city or depending on their particular um, uh, union contract, um, there's a, uh, we essentially um, uh, will pay them, um, pay them out sick leave that, ha that they have not used basically, um, that's accumulated. Um, and so, um, and this again is very much dependent on who retires and uh, years that people retire or don't retire. Um, it's capped at five thousand um, dollars, and um, and so it's I'm sorry, fifty five hundred dollars. And so um, uh, again, there are some years when we have more retirements or more people leave, and we have more payouts than what we've um, what we've budgeted for. So that's what a sick leave buyback is. Now, Mayor, say, I know I had a couple of residents on my ward who worked for the city and they became very ill and they were stricken with cancer and they used up all their sick time. Okay, when that happens, apparently other staff in the departments that they worked where they were very willing to help them give them some of their sick time. Does that happen or what? Yeah, there's um, there's something that's called the sick bank or sick leave bank, um, which is again part of um, part of our um, uh, collective bargaining agreements, and so um, uh, members. Um, employees can contribute to this sick leave bank and the bank is established and um, and there's actually even a committee of employees that that um, that when people petition to have access to sick leave bank if again because their sick leave has been expended um, that helps in that decision making process it's not really related to sick leave buyback but there is there is um, such a thing as a sick leave bank um, for employees that again have a have a severe illness like the one you described um, and that allows um, for their colleagues to be able to um, extend additional sick leave to them okay so th this here would not be the same thing as what no it's not no this is basically um, someone who's you know retiring um, and has a, a balance of sick leave um, left which is basically paid time off and um, for, 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 sick, for sickness or illness. And so um, this uh, basically allows, uh, again, uh, it's, we, we um, over time have uh, capped it through our collective bargaining agreements. Um, so um, uh, up to $5,500. And again, it depends on how much they have accumulated. It may not always be $5,500. It may be less than that, but, um, but um, that's what a sick leave buyback is and um, we do budget for it um, um, but again there are some years where um, uh, there may be more retirements or someone um, uh, so so this is a case where we we've come up short a little bit here at 28,000 so we need to move some money around to be able to cover that particular line item thank you Mayor. Councilor Jarrett um, so is this a case where this these monies haven't yet been spent or have we already you know gone into a deficit for a particular account uh or is it is it that 
once we approve this transfer, then you'll then that money will be spent. Um, so, you know, we have to pay these, you know, we have an obligation to pay these um, uh, uh, sick leave. Um, so in probably, in, I would say in the case of the sick leave buybacks, we probably already have done that. In some other cases where we have um, um, bills for things in some of the, like the technology communication lines or things like that, um, we, we, we haven't, but we're waiting for the funding to be there. Um, so, um, and then there's other, like some other bills that we've encumbered, um, but we won't pay them until there's money in the particular account. So yes, it's incumbent on, um, we, most of these, we won't pay, we can't pay them until we have the amount of money that's needed to cover them in the account. Uh, yeah, I was just happened to be reading section seven, seven of the charter and it seems, you know, very clear we can't spend it uh until but yeah i'm glad we're doing this process so we can spend the things we need to exactly yeah and a similar process happens in the school department every year as well um the school committee um, um the superintendent and the finance director for the schools comes to the school committee and the school committee has to vote to um to move money um again at the end of the year um, to basically true up accounts and um, and so and it's happening um, in cities and towns all around the Commonwealth as, as well. Okay, any other comments? Seeing none, roll call please. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Moved. Second. Motion has been made by Councilor Barr, seconded by Councilor Quinlan. Roll call, please, on adjourning. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. And Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, we've adjourned out of finance and we go back into the council meeting where we start with these council with these financial orders again. So 20.083 in order to approve issuance of refunding bonds. Um, this is the first reading, but two readings have been respectfully requested. Move to approve. Motion has been made by Councillor Labarge. Second. Seconded by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Hold up. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Suspend the rule. Suspend. Second. Motion has been made by Councillor Barge, second by Councillor Dwight to suspend rules. Is there any discussion on suspension rules? Roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor yes. Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Rules are suspended. Move second reading, please. Second. Motions are made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Jarrett, and second reading. Any discussion on second reading? Roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Right. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Hey, that passes in second reading. Moving on to 20.087 in order to approve spending to complete the Northview subdivision. 
first reading, but also two readings have been requested. Was there a motion? I said it. Okay, count. Council of the Barge, who seconded it? I second. second. Councilor Mary seconded it. Okay, any discussion on first reading? Councilor Dwight. So um, in, I, have to, I have to express that I have an interest in, as an abutter to this property, I am on the board of the Conway School of, of Design and they are a tenant that's an abutter. I have no financial interest and uh, I don't think there's a conflict, but just in case I'm going to state for the for purpose of full disclosure, my interest there. I will, st I will, I retain my right to vote on this. Thank you for that disclosure. Any other discussion? Okay, roll call please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Move to suspend, suspend the rules, please. Motion made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labar to suspend rules. Any discussion on suspension of rules? Roll call on suspension of rules, please. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. And Councilor Labarge. Yes. Move to approve the reading. Rosa suspended. Councilor Labarge has uh, made the motion. Councilor Dwight has seconded it for second reading. Any discussion on second reading? Roll call, please, on second reading. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. Okay, that passes in two readings. We're up to 20.088 in order to authorize payment of prior year bills. First reading, but two readings are requested. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Ooh. Councillor Dwight made the motion. Councillor Quinlan seconded it, I think. Um, any discussion? It's a toss up between Thorpe and Quinlan. Please. All right. Thorpe's, Thorpe's going to get the next one. I can feel it. Um, any discussion on first reading? Okay. Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Suspend the rule. Motion has been made to suspend rules by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion on suspension rules? Roll call, please, in suspension. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Move to approve second yes. reading. Motion's been made. Seconded. Second. And seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um. Any discussion on second reading? Okay, roll call please on second reading. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. 
Ne that passes in two readings. Next is 20.089, an order to authorize FY 2021 intermunicipal agreements. First reading, two readings are requested. Motion has been made by Councillor Dwight. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Any Do you want to read them again? I thought yeah, I, 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 was... I really enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm very thankful. I, I guess I only have to do this once a year. <laughs> okay, um, if you if you want to pass that up, go ahead. Be my guest. But... All right. Thanks for waving that reading. Um, uh, any discussion on this first reading? Okay, roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Move to, I mean, suspend the rule. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Barge, seconded by Councillor Dwight. To yes. suspend rules. Any discussion, suspension of rules? Roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay. Rules are suspended. Mm. Move for a second reading, please. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Labarge on second reading. Any discussion? Roll call, please, on second reading. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, that passes in two readings. Next is 20.091 in order to accept gift of labor materials to repair grave of George Hudestia. Uh, um, Council President, I would actually, may I ask that we consider items 20.091, uh, 20 92, 93, and 94 as a group? The motion's been made to take them as a group. Is there a second? Second. 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 <laughs> seconds. Uh, seconded by Councillor Jarrett. Any discussion on taking them as a group? Roll call on taking them as a group. Councillor nope. Labarge. To... Yes. Um, Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Point of information. Yeah. Are we are we voting to take them as a group or are we voting them to I thought we needed a group? I thought we needed a motion to take them as a group, no? No, I mean unless there's an objection and people want to sample them out, but if they if essentially it's it's by mutual consent. So I don't think but we'll complete the vote anyway, so I say yes. Right. I just wanted to make sure I, have, I knew what I was voting on. So doing it this way, we will have cut in half the number of votes. That we had to take. So. Yeah, sure enough. Okay. Councilor Dwight, what was it um, about two weeks ago where we took something by a group and you did a roll call vote on it? Okay. Right. Well, we're we're in the middle of it. There you go. So, Councilor. Okay. Guys, so I voted yes. Okay, <laughs> Councilor Dwight, and then Councilor Foster. Yes. And Councilor Jarrett. Yes. They are grouped. I uh, please approve uh, them as a group now. That's my motion. Second. Okay, motion's been made by Councillor and Councillor Nash. Are you waving? Yes. I have, one, I have one more thank you. Thank you. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is there a second on this? There was Councillor Quinn. Councillor Quinn. Okay, please. Another thank you. I forgot to mention Director Lascalia, who kept this project at the top of, you know, even though the funding dropped out because of the capital improvements program and the being, you know, kind of hit very hard this year, 
she kept it at the top of her uh, agenda and it's moving forward. So thank you to Donna. Huge thanks to Director Lascalia. I'm gonna tell you, she was on this call. I know, and she, now she's gone. That's right. So you are gonna to have to get on the horn tomorrow and thank her yourself. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Great thanks to Director Lascalia. Um, any other discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, those um, pass in first reading, which brings us to 20.095. In order for FY 2020 budget transfers, two readings are requested. Move approval, please. Motion is made by Councilor Dwight, second by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion on first reading? Roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Mayori. Yes. Move to suspend rules to allow for a second reading. Second. second. Motion made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Thorpe to suspend rules. Session. Roll call, please. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Move second reading, please. <clears throat> Motion's been made. Second. Seconded by Councillor Maori. Made by Councillor Dwight on second reading. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that passes in two readings. Moving on to financial orders that are on their second reading, 20.068, in order to appropriate balance of bond premium for replacement doors for Smith Folk Agricultural High School buildings, a, Building A. Move second reading, please. Motion has been made by Councillor Dwight. Second. Second. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion on second reading? Roll call, please. Okay. Um, Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. That passes in second reading. Next is 20.069 in order to authorize borrowing for $640,000 for new fire truck. Move to approve. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Dwight. Yes. Yep. Um, discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Next is 20.070 in order to appropriate 1.22 million from capital stabilization for various capital projects. Move to approve. Mm, motion's been made by Councillor Barge, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Foster. 
Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Next is 20.071 in order to appropriate $25,000 from cemetery trust and income for cemetery restorative work. Move to approve. Second. Motion to be made by Councilor Labarge, seconded by Councilor Dwight. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Next is 20.072 in order to appropriate $46,000 from PEG access and cable related funds to IT for various projects. Move approval, please. Second. Motion to be made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. And Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, that passed in second reading. Uh, 20.073 in order to reprogram $75,908 from MSBA school projects to SVAH, SVAHS gym lockers. Move to approve. Second. Yes. Motion made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Next is 20.074 in order to reprogram Ryan Road School cafeteria funds to NPS projects. Move approval, please. Seconded. Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Discussion. Roll call, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. Okay, that passes the second reading 20.075 in order to purchase land on Boggy Meadow Road to add to the Broad Brook Fitzgerald Lake Greenway. Move to approve. Second. Sorry. Motions made by Councilor Labarge, seconded by Councilor Quinlan. Discussion. Roll call, please. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. And Councilor Nash. Yes. Okay, that passes the second reading 20.078 in order to authorize King Street Corridor Improvements right of way acquisition. Move approval, please. Second. Motions made by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Quinlan. Discussion. Oh, wait, hold up. Um, thank you, Councillor. I was trying to get your attention. Thank you. Um, I actually need to request an amendment to this order on second reading. Um, sort of a late breaking uh, change we need to make. Um, so I mentioned at the last meeting that the, um, the right of way um, easements were a combination of in some cases we were um, purchasing and then in other cases we had some donations. Um, uh, certain property owners had um, uh, donated their easements. We have one of these easements that we have uh, 
but we have not been able to finalize and verify the donation for. Um, and so because of the required paperwork for uh, MassDOT um, and out of an abundance of caution, um, I want to actually amend the order um, as well as amend the order of taking um, to put in, to basically um, revert it back to a, not to a donation, but to an actual um, purchase of the um, easement um, because we don't want to um, delay the project, which is scheduled to go out for advertising. Uh, we're going to try to work through that issue. It's, it's actually Cumberland Farms and, um, and it uh, had to go through their whole sort of corporate chain and legal chain for approval. And there was some miscommunication there. So um, I was on the phone as late as 3.30 today speaking with their um, real estate division, but we were not able to get that uh, finalized. So I wanna ask basically to revert it back to as if we were purchasing it. Um, and then we're going to work with them over the next days to hopefully get that corrected. But we want the order to pass to represent what the what the case is right now. So on the order before you, the order authorizing acquisition of property interest, um, the, the amendment I would ask for would be the, um, the total sum that's listed at the bottom, um, which is coming from chapter 90 monies, currently reads 215,500. Um, and I would ask that that be changed to $229,700. Um, and that would basically reflect $14,200 difference, which is the value, the appraised value of the, um, of the Cumberland Farms temporary easement. So that would be an amendment I would ask, uh, or would ask that that order be changed to reflect the $215,500. Laura, did you get that? I did. And again, this right. happened sort of late breaking, so I wasn't able to even get a substitute order to send to you, but it's basically changing that wording. Um, both verbally. Well, I, I move to amend actually to, and essentially what we're changing, the only thing we're changing is the sum. Is that correct? There's no other aspect That's of the right. That's correct. correct. Yes. The only, there, there is a, um, on the actual order of taking itself on page 14, um, there's a listing for exhibit B11 and it says Cumberland, it lists Cumberland Farms and it lists, currently it lists damages awarded zero donation and we would need to just replace that with uh, $14,200 on uh, page 14. I don't know if it's, a, if it's attached to the order or if it's a separate, um, it's basically it's the It'll be the order of taking that you're going to sign. So we can get that right. amendment to Laura before you sign it. So I don't think you, you necessarily have to vote on that amendment. But it's right. really uh, because the, yeah, I'm looking at the order of taking and it's not, uh, it is holistic. It is not, um, let me see, I'm double checking here. Well, if you scroll through. So it's down to 14. Yeah, it is on there. I, I actually just just to be safe, I would actually like to amend. Um, going back to page fourteen. I mean, the order of taking was prepared by Attorney Seawald for you to sign if this order passes. So I don't know that you necessarily have to amend it. I mean, if if the order passes, he can provide an amended version. But if, if you want to do if we want to do it just to be cautious, let's. You can certainly add it to the amendment. Yeah, I would like to err on the side of. Um, Caution there, and um, so damage is awarded under donate on the under the on page fourteen. It's Exhibit B dash eleven Cumberland Farms Inc. And currently, we're proposing to amend damage is awarded after the colon, which now reads as zero dollars and do a comma donation. And strike that, and then I'm sorry, Your Honor. What was the total? Uh, Fourteen thousand two hundred dollars. Okay, and amend it to reflect fourteen thousand two hundred dollars. Second. Okay. Any any further discussion on that amended language? Okay. Roll call, please. 
Okay, so this on is amendment. on the amendment, yeah. Right. Okay, um, Councilor Shera? Yes. Councilor Thorpe? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Foster? Yes. Councilor Jarrett? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Maori? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor Quinlan? Yes. Okay. And now uh, to, to the larger motion, I guess. Right. So um, to this order as amended. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call, please. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. And Councilor Shara. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading as amended. And I don't know of any further business. Um, well, then I'm kind of disposed to move for adjournment. Second. Motions have made and seconded to adjourn. And roll call, please. Okay. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, thank you. We are adjourned, everybody. And see y'all. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll see you. Um, I was I'll hoping see you.